Hey, everybody. How are you? I'm sorry. All right. Sorry, guys. I'm waiting for my friend Lloyd. He's not here yet. He's waiting for me to send him the link, and I did. But hold on. I got to get everything ready. Hold on. Lloyd's there. I don't know what happened to Lloyd. Hold on. He just sent me a message. There he goes. Lloyd's right there. See, I told you. He's right here. See these guys? I could hear you, Sam. I was there. No, sorry. Someone was disturbing me on my Facebook. They always send me messages when I'm live. And so I got distracted, sir. Sorry about that. And my allergies are not helping me. <laughs> no worries. No worries. I mean, it wouldn't be YouTube if you, if you didn't make a bungle every time you like start a show, right? That happens to me all yeah. the time. We are here now, sir. Hopefully we won't get distracted by the grace of Jesus Christ. But hey, friend, the show is yours. Everyone's here. They want to learn why Allah is the true God and Muhammad is his messenger. So come on. Okay, well... Um... Yeah, so, so thanks for having me back. Any comments on the last show? Anything you want to say before we uh, dive right in? All I remember, I remember a lot, but when I say the main point was somehow you're going to segue from last session into Hobal, Hubble, and Bal. Oh, is Hubal. Is that what you plan on doing today? Some connection with Hubble? Or who yeah, I, we're going to start, definitely start going down that road. We're going to start, oh, the, the pace will, will pick up. So I will, so, so let's begin right after I say the following. The following. Okay, we can begin. All right, you got it. Sorry, guys, if I look like a Mack truck hit my face because it's allergy mm -hmm. season and allergies suck. I think this is Allah's punishment on me and Lloyd for exposing him. See? And you told me Allah's not real. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So. So. Yeah. Let's just dive in and see where we get. So, I'm just going to go back to one of our previous slides. I just want you guys to remind you, Gobekli Tepe is within literally walking distance. At least it would have been back in the day. It's like what 12 kilometers of where Abraham is said to have lived. On top of that, three towns in that area are named after Abraham's family. So one is named after, I believe, his grandfather, his uncle, and his brother. So you've got three towns named after the family of Abraham. And you have the Muslims looking for the original religion of Abraham, the oldest religion in the world. Which, now don't forget, Gobekli Tepe is something like 12,000 years old. It was buried, and it's known to have been in use probably for thousands of years before that happened. Which means, and now you've also got this temple here, which is even older, apparently, by at least a thousand years. So this area is known to have, we know of at least, I think, 19 of these locations in this area, <clears throat> which means the Muslims might then have been thinking this area is the oldest known location with the oldest known temples and the oldest known architecture in the world. This must be where Abraham got his original religion from, which we know is astrological deity worship, paganism. Just to so, let you know, one thing, Lloyd, in case if you see me disappear, it's not because I'm gone. I'm in the background. I'm listening. I'm just being uh, distracted, so I'm going to take care of distraction. So if you, I'm still listening. Okay, <clears throat> right. So so Sam is uh, disappearing. Not to worry. So uh, your thoughts on that would be would be obviously interesting. To what do you guys think of that connection? That Abraham is connected now to the oldest pagan religion in the world, and of course that Muslims were trying to find this oldest religion, this first religion, which happens to be again pagan. And um, so they, they tie this to Abraham, and Abraham is from this region. So do you think that this makes a strong argument for Abraham being from this region and the connection that Muslims are trying to find the world's oldest religion, the first religion? Yes. Sam, your, your um, thoughts on that? Yes. In fact, what I would like to understand, the fact that a Abraham comes from the, this particular region, do you then believe, as later rabbinic tradition <clears throat> stated, that he pretty much came out of a pagan family because, you know, the yes. rabbinic tradition, which the Quran stole, that his father was <clears throat> actually an idol maker. I think that, look, even the Jews admit to that. I believe even they admit to that. And it's, it's I think they acknowledge that they come from, from a milieu that was definitely pagan. If you look at the, the original Hebrew language, 
it is it is at root in the early history it is fairly this the same as the early Canaanite languages the I think the Ugaritic I'm not sure I could be wrong there but but the languages are the same so they came from the same root and then they split off okay so in other words this research shows because later rabbinic Jew tradition which found its way in the Quran if you guys are not familiar and I'm going to try to speak as less often as possible because I want to give them all the time but I just want you guys to understand <laughs> When you read the chronic narrative, you're going to find stories of a young Abraham smashing idols because his people were involved in idolatry. His father was involved in <clears throat> idolatry and Abraham smashed the idols and that got him in trouble and actually got him thrown in the fire. And Islamic tradition says it was because the King Nimrod persecuted him. Now, if you guys don't know this. A lot of that comes from rabbinic Judaism. These stories are found in rabbinic Judaism. Keep that in mind. So I was wondering, this was asking Lloyd, do you think there's any credibility to the tradition of the Jews that Abraham was steeped in idolatry and then converted to the worship of the one true God? So keep that in mind when you read your Quran. I don't know if you know this. Many of you may not have read the Quran. There are stories of Abraham smashing the idols of his people because his father was involved in making idols and yet this is not something the Quran made up it was taken from jewish sources rabbinic judaism so keep that in mind so good brother i just want to clarify why i asked that question okay yeah also you'll find we'll find later as i go through the series you'll find that there's actually a, a story of muhammad who goes into the kaaba and he starts to smash all the idols but muhammad doesn't do them by hand he always has to do one better than any story of any figure in the bible muhammad takes his cane and he points his cane at the idols and any idol that he points his cane at falls to the ground and smashes itself so but before he says it he will say a quote from the quran so he'll quote this one passage but we'll get to that later so he will point his cane say this word these words from the quran and the idol will just basically fall down and break itself so yeah that's 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 the islam going one better than abraham okay <clears throat> okay so so i'm Okay, so let me continue here. So I will cancel that. We'll go to here and then we'll begin with the, the new session. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so we're going to look at the word mu, right? Now, mu, so mu, mu, right? We're going to have a quick look at Arabic grammar. I thought it's going to be very important to look at some Arabic grammar. Um, okay, now, the Sharia. Sharia enables Muslims to bring their lives in line with, with the will of Allah. So a Muslim is Sharia compliant, right? The mud. <clears throat> sorry, you know what? I, I've I've made a uh, wrong mistake here with my little guy. Oh, contains. Okay, so yeah. so the word Muslim contains its Arabic meaning in its definition. The word Muslim in Arabic has two parts: the mu prefix. And I'm going to have to do this again and fix this poor guy. Let me just move my little cow guy out of the way here. Thanks, thanks cow guy. Right. There's two parts, the mu prefix, right? And the triliteral root of the word Islam. So mu and then SLM, Islam, right? And we, we will see as we go through, and I have shown you already that SLM originally referred to the star god Shalim. It was originally referenced to a pagan god. It was not originally a reference to shalom or peace. So the word Islam is a verbal noun that means submission. So when mu is prefixed to such an Arabic root, right, the resulting noun means a person who does the thing that the root word denotes. So mu, the word mu always comes before mu, someone who does this. Like if you were a carpenter, you would be mu carpenter, someone who does carpentry, right? Muslim, one who submits to what? Allah's will, which is the sharia, Islamic law. Thus, a Muslim is by definition Sharia adherent because that's what the word means. If someone claims to be a Muslim or converts to Islam, was born into Islam and does not apostatize or separate, it is reasonable to conclude that such a person is Sharia compliant at a minimum, right? It is implied unless and until they demonstrate otherwise. The converse is also true. One who does not submit to Sharia, who does not adhere to Sharia, does not meet the linguistic definition of Muslim. Now, the word mu is important, <clears throat> but I wanted to clarify that. Okay. I'm going to skip over this, but um, 
So Muslims are required to do various things, okay? So we'll skip over that. Now the word mu. Earlier in history, we had the word ma. Right? So makoraba. So last week we did where is makoraba, right? We know it's in Yemen. Al Mahabisha near the near the near Haran, right? Haran also happens to be in Turkey, where Abraham supposedly lived. So ma koraba, the what? It's from ma to mu. Ma karaba is easily derived from muqaribba, right? Because we have saw from one of the references I showed last week that this is the Latinization of the muqarib. Ma karaba is the Latinization of the Yemeni Arabic muqaribba. Muqaribba are priest kings who served the will of Allah al Makkah. Because one of the names of al Makkah, the moon god of Babylon and the moon god of Yemen and the moon god of Arabia, the chief deity in the pantheon of Arabia, was known as al Makkah, but he was also known as Allah. He was the Allah, right? And under Islam, you have you had the caliphate, the Khalifa, and the leader was called the Amir al Mukmanin, right? And this is important. Muk. Now we're back to Mu. And Menin. So we'll be looking at these words as important. The Amir al Mukmanin, the commander of the believers. Menin in Islam, the believers. Okay. Amir al Muslimin, commander of the Muslims, which the Al Muravids first assumed. So the term Muslims comes from the Al Muravids. They were part of an Umayyad group. Right. So the Muslims, before they were called, now we know they were called the Sarasans, we know they were called different things, the believers. They were, the, they were called the believers. They were called the Saracens. They were called other things. And then eventually they became the Muslims. But about 200 years down the line only, they became the Muslims. Right? So there's a small group called the Muslims because the believers was the title that the Umayyads were using. And this group, not to take, not to try to take authority that they didn't have and, and incur the wrath of the, of the Umayyads, they called themselves the Muslims, the Muslimin. When the when the Abbasids eventually supplanted the Umayyads, the Abbasids to to create a to create a culture and a definition that was different from before to separate, they took on the term and made popular the term Muslim or Muslimin. So Amir al Muslimin, a title which the Al Muravids first assumed in contradistinction to the Amir al Muqmanin, right? The latter title was borne by independent dynasties. The Al Muravids, however, recognized the supremacy. Sorry, of the Abbasids. My fault and did not wish to arrogate to themselves the title of the caliphs, who were called the Muqmanin. So they established a sub-caliphate with a title of their own, the Muslimin. Right? So eventually the Abbasids adopted the term Muslimin because the believers, now the believers is kind of an ecumenical term because there was at one point like this effort, it would seem, to, to create one religion that believed in monotheism which combined these, these heretical sects that we've spoken of before, the Christians, the Messianic Jews, and possibly some other non-Orthodox Jews, as well as these, these now forming Muslims who are all monotheists, and they tried to all be the believers, right? They all were believers, but that, but that ecumenical movement did not work. There were too many differences, and so to create their own personal identity, they adopted the term the Muslimin. Uh, any thoughts from you, Sam, before I move on? <clears throat> Yeah, I want people to understand the stuff he's saying is not something that is controversial, meaning he's making stuff up as he goes along, and he's just coming up with stuff that is laughable. What he just said about the title, El Mu'minin or El Mu'minun, what is Arabic terms? There's actually <clears throat> one of the premier scholars of Islam. His name is Fred Donner. Fred Donner. Fred, you guys know how to spell it, Fred. D-O-N-N-E-R. He wrote a book, a very influential book, and he's respected in academia. Now, again, as both Lloyd and I have said, academia doesn't mean that you're sound in your scholarship. But be that as it may, what I'm doing is showing you this view that the title Believers was an inclusive term. Fred Donner wrote a book on this very theme that the term believers was used to include all the monotheistic groups, not just those who became known as Muslims, but even Jews and Christians and the Muslims were <clears throat> categorized under this title, under this category rubric, the believers. 
because it was a term that was inclusive to include them in the ummah, the community. So what he's telling you is stuff that even those in academia have argued for. Fred Donner, mm -hmm. get his book on the believers. So he's, yeah. he's considered a legitimate bona fide scholar and academician. But go ahead, brother. I just wanted to make sure. There's, I think there's every reason to to agree with him on that point. So we'll continue. This is, this is all relevant. So the term Malik, Abd al-Malik, the slave of the Malik. Okay, Malik, Abd al-Malik, the slave of the Malik. What is the Malik? What is a Malik? And then Muluk, Muluk, and Mukkariba. What do these words have in common? Why are they important? We're going to be discussing all of this. So early first millennium BC, the political leaders of that region of Yemen, especially the Maliks or the Muluk, created a commonwealth occupying most of South Arabia. They took the title of the Muqarrib Sib, or the Muqarrib of Saba, or the sheep of Sheba, the Muqarrib of the Sabaeans, the Muqarrib, Muqarrib, right? So now I'm going to give you a word here. So I'm just going to give you like, a, <clears throat> see, mu. so we have the term mu, right? Ha-rib, okay, Muqarrib. And you'll see sometimes Muqarabal because you see Muqarib of Baal. The Muqarib Baal. Can you, are you guys starting to put this together? Right? So this will come clear. So they were the Muqarib of the Sabaeans. The Muqariban were special retainers of the ruler, right? Muqariban were the special retailers of the ruler. The ruler was the Muqarib, right? Now, in the Encyclopedia of Islam, we have this reference, Muqarib, literally one who unifies. In ancient Yemen, it was a sovereign superior to the kings. Now, one could argue that Muhammad was a very special warrior priest king, but Muhammad was greater than the kings. Muhammad was the greatest authority, right? But Muqarib was a sovereign superior to the kings, so he was like an emperor. So this is a very, very high level rank. And this not only had rank on earth as a civil rank, it also happened to have a very strong religious overtone, right? Very, very strongly religious. So many impressive buildings in Southern Arabia were temples dedicated to pagan deities. The earlier rulers of Sheba, who bore the title of Muqarib, combined the functions of prince and priest. So prince and priest, and we know Muqarib, was a very, very high, very lofty title, greater than the kings. In fact, he could be the emperor over multiple kings, right? So that's the Muqarib. <clears throat> Muqarib was a priest king, right? And in fact, would be a warrior priest king. So the plural romanized Muqarribba, Makaraba. As we saw from a different resource previous show, Makaraba was simply the Latinization of the Muqarribba. Let's continue. Add. Okay, joining together a contract, a written designation of succession left by Caliph from the time of the Umayyad Caliph, Abd al-Malik onwards. Okay, it denotes a covenant with men. Okay, in, and they speak of the religion, religious engagement into which the believers. Now, oddly, this language is still part of the Islamic lexicon, but it, they've forgotten its history, its origin, right? The believers. Okay, in law, ad is political enactments and treaties. Now, notice, it's not just religious. Right? It is also political. Remember, Islam is a political system. It's a deen. Land which had capitulated before conquest was known as Ad land. Right, That's political overthrow. That's, that's invasion. And in mysticism, Ad is the covenant. Vows which vary in different orders with which the dervish, this now again is your Sufis, is introduced into the fraternity. So these words, notice these words have quote-unquote religious meanings, but also political meanings, military meanings, as well as meanings in terms of mysticism and magic. So understand these words are, are very broad. Al-Sabikun, <clears throat> right? Apply to the Prophet, the Imams, and Fatima in recognition of their status as pre-existent beings. Oh, what? what? Muhammad is a pre-existent being, the first of Allah's creatures to respond to the demand, am I not your Lord? Your thoughts on that, Sam? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, I want people to be very clear in reading what he's posted on the screen. Pay attention. You'll notice that you'll find in Islam, not just in Shia Islam, you do have in Sunni Islam, as he mentioned in previous sessions. If you've been following along, I just want to remind people because to them, this is like shocking. How can you say that 
they're pre-existent beings when Islam says Muhammad is just a man. If you remember the previous sessions, and he gave you documentation, and this is something you'll find among the Sufis, not the Zashia, because some will say, well, the Shia, they're, this, they're a small group. They don't represent 85% of the Muslims because 85% of Muslims claim to be Sunni. Yep, Nur Muhammad. You just got it right here. Exactly. Yeah, if, you remember, if you remember what he said, and this was not something that he just got from fringe groups. There is a tradition in those mystical Sunni Muslims who embrace what's called Tasawwuf, Sufism, that <clears throat> Muhammad's light is pre-existent. And his light is from the nur of Allah and everything else <clears throat> was illuminated by the light of Muhammad. So this view that he's sharing with you, don't think it's wacky and out there. It is a view held by many Sunni Muslims, especially those who are into mystical Islam and Shia Islam. And this statement, am I not your Lord? This is actually derived from a statement in the Quran. Chapter 7, verses 172, 173. So I'm trying to help you guys understand where he's getting this from. If you read chapter 7, verse 172, 173 of the Quran, there it talks about the descendants of Adam according to the sound interpretation. Statements attributed to Muhammad. You'll find this in Ibn Kathir. When Allah created Adam, so I want to con connect it to what you're saying. Allah then took all the seed of Adam from his loins. He stroke his back. One tradition says he stroke his back and the right side and white people came out looking like white ants. And he said, for paradise and I don't care. Then he stroke the left side of his back and black people came out like black ants. And he says to hell and I don't care. But according to a sound tradition, to Muhammad, Muhammad told, I'm sorry, Allah told, well, Muhammad is the alter ego of Allah. I just want to make this point so you can go what he's saying. Allah told all the descendants that would be born from Adam. He took them all out. This is in a sound tradition. You'll find it in Ibn Kathir's exposition of chapter 7, verse 172, 173. He took all of Adam's descendants and he made a covenant with them it's called Mithak. Mithak. The covenant was, am I not your Lord? They say yes. Do you agree to worship me? They said yes. So then he put him back in Adam's loins so that on the day of judgment, he'll remind everyone of the covenant he made while they're in Adam's loins. So according to what he just read, when <clears throat> Allah took out the descendants from Adam's loins, Muhammad was the first one who said, yes, you are my Lord. Am I getting that tradition right there? Is that what he said? He's the first it's one. Fascinating. I have heard of that. Actually, I didn't know all of that, but oh, yeah, I've that's heard it in, before, but that is just nuts. That's in Ibn Kathir. If you, <laughs> if you read his abridged English translation, go to chapter 7, 172, 173. I can yeah, but he's not my scholar, Sam. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's... <laughs> But you got it. So you got that. So this tradition, what you're saying, that's where they're getting Muhammad was the first to say, yes, I agree. Yeah. I mean, we've spoken about also the light. I mean, Muhammad's light is what lights up the throne of Allah. Someone mentioned yeah. that. Um, so okay. <clears throat> Let me continue. All of this will. Okay. So they speak here of, okay, the Muqarib of Sabah, who erected the wall of the Awam, the house of al Makkah. Right. So the Muqarib erected the wall of Awam. Okay. The house of al Makkah. So the Muqarab would raise the, the temple, okay, the house of al Makkah. Where's the house of al, al Makkah today? Well, we know where al Makkah is, but we'll... Okay, Sabikun. Now notice, al Sabikun, the foregoers, right? Those who went before. The term derives primarily from the Quran, okay? They got here, well, Sabikun, al Sabikun, okay, Muqaribun. Oh, so they seem to be the same thing, the Sabikun and the Muqaribun. So hold on. Hang on, the Quran speaks of the Muqaribun, who are the foregoers, the ones who come before. Now suddenly that's an odd thing, and they speak of the Sabaknahum, the Sabah, the Sabaknahum. How could we not be superior to the angels since we preceded them? We were the Sabaknahum in knowledge of our Lord. So hold on, these people from Sabah, the Muqaribun, they are superior in religious knowledge. These people are important. They are the foregoers. Okay? which is very, very unusual, the first of God's creatures to respond to the demand, am I not your Lord? The weird part is, these sabbikun, these muqaribun, these people of Saba, are pagans, outright Babylonian 
pagans. So the, this, this starts to look a little odd now that the Quran actually recognizes this. So South Arabia, led by a muqarib, a sovereign superior to the kings whose name means unifier. Now the unifier here means a military conqueror who will unify by means of force, right? Qarabil, Qarabil. Now we just, I just mentioned earlier to you guys, Qarab il, Qarab ili, the name comes up, Muqarabil, Muqarabal. The mu, the one who does the will of Baal. Okay, this is what we're going to start seeing. Qarab, the Qarab of il, the Qarab of el. What was the Canaan name of the Canaanite god that the Jews had to fight against? El, Il, El. These are the Karibs of El. The Muk, the one who does the will of El. All right. <clears throat> so the building of the temple of Al Makkah, Al Muk, the great god of the Sabaeans in the center of the town. So they built the temple of Al Makkah, Al Makkah, 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 Makkah. Okay, it keeps coming up. They speak of in South Arabia, the kingdom of Sheba, with its capital at Marib, was the leading state in the first millennium BC. It was very important, very powerful. It was formed by a tribal confederation headed by a ruler who was given the title of the Muqarib, right? They speak of Solomon and the queen of Sheba, see Bilkis. And so, okay, that's the, never mind, this is not too important. The queen of Sheba is going to be another story. But they say the queen is not an otherwise attested historical figure. There's no reference to a queen in any Sabaean inscriptions, although queens of the Arabs are cited in several 8th century BC Assyrian inscriptions. So in other words, they're just saying there's no outside attestation of the queen of Sheba being a real figure. Now, let's go to this. Now we've got to look at some of the Jewish scriptures, the Jewish uh, word, well, a, Jew, a few Jewish words, ha-menim, mukmenin, and muhajirun, muk, the word again. So this is called the Berkat Ha-Menim, the benediction concerning heretics. In other words, technically, this would be a curse. Okay? The Menim, so Berkat Ha-Menim, the Berkat Ha-Menim comes up a lot. Menim is plural. Menim, single, plural. And also you have Min, single, here. So Mukmenim are the believers, plural. Okay? Mukmenim, that's what the Arabs call themselves, the Mukmenim. However, the word menin in the Hebrew means heretics, heretics. So remember, the Christians were called Christos, right? The believers of Christos, right? And they eventually said, yes, we are. And they took, so what was technically an insult levied against people who followed Christ? Christians said, yes, we are. And they took it and they said, yeah, we adopt this name. However, the Muslims were also called the, the ha menim, the people who are heretics and the muslims eventually said yeah that's us we're the heretics thank you right so in the hebrew min is heretic in the arabic muk min is a believer that's right reverse thing. right so mu is just the prefix assigning the next word to the person one who min is a heretic is a believer and now they even call themselves musli mean yeah let me right? confirm what you're saying Sorry? in rabbinic tradition Followers of Jesus were called minim, minim, plural. The im is plural. So a follower of Jesus is called a min. This is a statement in rabbinic tradition in reference to those Jews who follow Jesus. So what he's telling you, brethren, this is a fact. Let me repeat what he's saying because this is interesting how he's connecting terms that Muslims have taken and revamped that are originally referred to pagans and heretics, like the word hunafa, hanif, from Syriac, chenpa, chenfa, that meant a pagan. Now, here you have the word min, which was used for <clears throat> those Jews or those followers of Jesus. In the Talmud, followers of Jesus are called min im. Im is plural. Im is plural. So it means those <clears throat> heretics. And heretic is min. So this word min was used at first to refer to heretics who believed in Jesus. So it's interesting that min is now adopted in the Arabic language as something positive. So keep that in mind, guys. Listen to what he's saying. So go ahead, brother. And one has to wonder if they were heretical believers in Jesus in the beginning, which claim has been made historically. Yes, exactly. exactly. So one has to wonder. Okay. So there's this word mene. Actually, hold on. Maybe I need to bring this up. Let me actually, yes, I may need to actually reference this document. 
main A. Okay, so let me do this. So I'm actually going to do this exact thing. Um, <clears throat> Yes, as you do that, people are shocked. Yes, yep. brother, it's in rabbinic Jewish tradition and the Talmud. Followers of Jesus are called min im. Im is plural. It's a plural masculine stuff. It's like Elohim, Adonim, Adoshim. A min in rabbinic Judaism was a heretic who followed Jesus. Min. So, min. so now I'm going to look at something here. Okay, I'm going to bring this up. Just bring up this file. Okay, so this is a book that I'm going to show you guys now. Okay, let me just go back so I can see the screen again where I am. Okay, so this might be interesting. This is cool. This is John C. Reeves, very well known, does some really great work. Okay, watch a lot of his stuff. Okay, prologue a minute to a history of Islamicate Manichaeism. Hold on, Manichaeism. Okay, let's look up the term Mene. Okay. Notice here, now this is from the Jewish tradition. They say there was a man named Mene who chose to believe in two deities, okay? One of whom made the good things and one of whom made the bad. They became a great nation. They were the Zoroastrians. They were the Zoroastrians, the one termed in Arabic Al-Majus, the Magians. Okay, that is fascinating. And of course, if you continue with Mene, right? They speak here of, okay, they speak here of, Thereupon he executed him, then abolished this religion. For this reason, those who believe in two deities are called Menim, after the name of Mene. Now, who is Mene? Well, Mene is Mani, the Manichaean. Right? I wish Sam was here to, to uh, hopefully we'll catch up with Sam in a moment. Right? But, so Sam, I want to show you now this term Menim. The Jews also use the term Mene. So it comes from the name of Mene. So there was a man named Mene who chose to believe in two deities, one of whom made the good things and one of whom made the bad. This would be a Gnostic who believed in the good God and the bad God, the dualism. And he says, and they were the Zoroastrians. Now, I can confirm for you that the Zoroastrians were also Gnostics, right? There was a very, very aggressive strain of Zoroastrian or Persian Gnosticism, right? Now, notice they speak here of Mena, and they said, thereupon he executed him and then abolished this religion. For this reason, those who believe in two deities are called, and he calls them Menim, after the name of Mene. Mene is Mani, Mani of Manichaeism. So the Muslims here are claiming that they are the followers of Mani. Is that your thoughts, Sam? Yo, you're muted, Sam. Sam, you're muted. I can't hear you. I'm yeah. so sorry, man. My, I'm telling you, the genie is attacking me because of you. Ever since you started the series, these genies have been attacking me and not leaving me alone. What I'm saying is Islam is nothing but a hodgepodge of mass confusion. You have the paganism. You have the Gnosticism. You have heretical forms of Judaism, Christianity, and Zoroastrianism all mixed in together. And you add Muhammad, and there's Islam. I mean, this is... I don't know. The real miracle is that people think Islam is a miracle. The historical, archaeological, textual data shows Islam is a joke. The Quran is from the pit of hell. It is nothing more than a hodgepodge of all these sources combined with Muhammad added. Yeah. Now, here's what's interesting. I'm going to give you a link. Did you know just recently Shabir Ali on Let the Quran Speak was asked a question? Mm -hmm. Why is it that Islam shows so much affinity so, to Zoroastrianism? He had to hmm. answer that question. I'm going to give you the link. Now, guys, even people who have studied Zoroastrianism see how heavily influential Zoroastrianism has been on Islam so that Shabir Ali had to answer that question because he was asked of it. And I'll get you the link. Now, for those of you, I also gave you the link to Ibn Kathir, and I'll send it to you in private, where he mentions that hadith that when Allah created Adam, he showed him his descendants and made that covenant. Am I not your Lord? So keep that in mind. So go ahead, brother. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully this shows that this, this idea of them being called the Menims, they were not Orthodox Christians. They were fake Christians. They were Gnostics. So Zoroastrians, Manichaeanism, Mani. So now you've got this link from the Jews calling that this historical link. Okay. Let's continue. Muqarib to Malik. So the word Muqarib means priest kings or federators, right? They would be using military force to federate, to join. 
In the fourth century BC, the title was replaced by the word Malik. So, the, so they replaced the term Muqarib with the term Malik because they wanted to separate from the Yemeni origins. So they wanted their own term. So they, they adopted the term Malik, the king. Who was Malik? Who was this king? Well, the heavenly king, of course, right? The title of the ruler who held primacy over tribes linked by a covenant, the Ad. We spoke of that. And Muqarib is a South Arabian, South Arabian hegemon, head of a confederation of South Arabian, South Arabian shabs headed by the kings, the kings of the Malik, right? The Malik. It is clear that early 800 to 400 BC, political authority resided with one leader, a Malik, a king of his own ethnic tribe, appointed as Muqarrib of a council of tribal elders. So the Muqarrib issued edicts that carried out the decision of the council and presided over building projects, ritual hunts, sacrifices. Some of the most famous inscriptions of these Maliks record the military conquests of the Muqarribs, who were evidently successful in confederating tribal groups through the rites of pilgrimage, okay, and then using social cohesion to conscript military forces, according to scholar Joy McCorriston. So understand, this was a military authority, a warrior, priest, king, right? It wasn't simply a religious term. Hegemon is something such as a political state, having dominant influence or authority over others, possessing hegemony. So this is a political slash military term. It means you are dominating. Now let's look at Hubal. Hubal, okay? So Ha-Malak, Molek, or Molek, same as Malcolm, okay? This is some very early Hebrew script here, Ha-Malak. So Hubal was a god worshipped in pre-Islamic Arabia. No surprise there. In pre-Islamic Makkah, there was a temple to the moon god Hubal. You would know it as the it's a square building in Mecca. Good grief, I can never remember the name. Is it, These uh, two, there are two Greek manuscripts of the Periplus, which are as far as I know. Temple? temple in Mecca, there's something. Oh, yeah. Ooh, I can never remember. The Madonna Temple, man, in Chicago. No, yeah, the Kaaba. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah, I knew, I knew the name would come to someone, one of us. So the two Greek manuscripts of the Periplus used the Latinized Carabale, right? The name represents a transcription of the Sabaean name Carib El, Carabal, blessed by or following God. Now, following God, the god El. El was the Canaanite god. El was also a title of the main god of the pantheon, which happened to be the Babylonian religion as well, which was the god Maka. Okay, fascinating. Let's continue. It was a royal name shared by numerous South Arabian rulers, blessed by or following Baal, the Karib of Baal, Karibal, Karibal. That was their god, blessed by the Muqarib, Muqs, okay? Blessed by or following Baal. So the term Hu, okay? <clears throat> hu, Baal, Hu, the term Hu, just by a sheer coincidence, okay? Huwa, in Arabic, meaning he, a pronoun a name of or for God in Sufism, Islamic Sufism, literally Hebrew and Arabic for the English third person. It is used to avoid attribution of, of a grammatical gender to Allah. Because Allah is genderless. Allah has no gender. God, the God of the Bible, says, I am he. I am masculine, right? God happens to identify as male. Yep. Now, what is interesting, if you go to Huwa, how we sing, you know, plural, Huwa, if you go to the Encyclopedia of Islam, Huwa translates as a snake charmer, an itinerant mountbank. In other words, a con man. Hmm. Snake charmer. He charms snakes. Serpent. A con man. Allah is the great deceiver. Serpent. Satan. Yeah. Yeah. Allah. So, so Nicodemus, Nic Nic Nicodemus Serpica says, so Allah is Babylonian pagan god of the moon. Yeah, we're starting to get there. Yeah, you're starting to get it now. Okay, moving on. So... Now, let's look at the Carthaginians. They practiced child sacrifice after decades of scholarship denying that the Carthaginians sacrificed their children. New research has found overwhelming evidence that this ancient civilization really did carry out the practice, right? So, Josephine Quinn of Oxford University's Faculty of Classics, an author of the paper that was published in the journal Antiquity, said it's becoming increasingly clear that the stories about Carthaginian child sacrifice is true. This is something the Romans and the Greeks said the Carthaginians did. It was part of the popular history of Carthage. Children, male and female, mostly a few weeks old, were sacrificed by the Carthaginians at locations known as Tophets. The practice was also carried out by their neighbors at other Phoenician colonies in Sicily, Sardinia, and Malta. And of course, dedications from the children's parents to the gods are inscribed on slabs of stone above their cremated remains, ending with the explanation that the god or gods concerned had 
heard my voice and blessed me. They worshipped the god Baal Hamon, meaning the face of Baal. Okay, that's the University of Oxford, right? That's their paper. Baal's going to be very important to us. So the Carthaginians, the examination of the skeletal remains and the associated grave goods and the stelae show that the Phoenicians did indeed practice child sacrifice. This claim was made in the 60s. The Italians said it. Well, scholars said it, but the Italians didn't like that it smeared the, 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 the good name of the Italians and they pushed back. But now the evidence is overwhelming. So, so detestable was the practice of child sacrifice in Israel that Jeremiah prophesied that the valley of Hinnom, Baal, Hamon, right? Who knows, might be, might be linguistically linked, would become the valley of slaughter because there the Lord would judge and punish those who engaged in child sacrifice, right? This is all linked to this. So the Phoenicians and their child sacrifice to the god Baal. Baal is who Baal. Who is he who is Baal? The con man who is Baal, right? The deceiver who is Baal. Deus had an idol belonging to Amr bin Humama al-Dawsi. That's obviously, a, that's definitely, he looks, that looks, mm, could be, could be, not sure. Is, is that Orthodox or is that, or is that Buddhist? Can't tell that name. So Quresh <clears throat> had an idol by a well in the middle of the Kaaba called Hubal. Wait, the Koresh had an idol by well in the middle of the Kaaba called Hubal. Okay, fine. By the place of Zamzam. Okay. And the Koresh claimed they had a right to share it. So Abdul Muttalib, Abdul Muttalib denied this, but was willing to submit the matter to the sacred lot, the drawing of lots. He said that he would make two arrows for the Kaaba, two for them and two for himself. And this was agreed. And he made two yellow arrows for the Kaaba, two black ones and two white ones for the Koresh. They were given to the priest in charge of the arrows and they were then thrown beside Hubal. Hubal was the image in the middle of, I love what they do here, was an image, just a random image. Yeah, no, it was the image in the middle of the Kaaba. Indeed, the greatest of the images in the Kaaba, the god of the Kaaba was Hubal. It is that referred to by Abu Sufyan ibn Harb at the Battle of Uhud when he cried, Arise Hubal or Hubalu Akbar, make your religion victorious. Any thoughts, Sam, before I go on? Yes, uh, just two comments I want to make. Joel, I know you're very excited. I need you to get off your horse and calm down. No, the term Baal can be used a proper name or a name. Yep. Don't impose modern linguistic distinctions on ancient cultures. I know you're trying to wax eloquent and impress us, but the more you do, the less impressed I become. Yeah, Baal could be, so you could have the Baal of this place, the god of this place, right? Yes. Okay. Baal generic. could be a personal name. It could be a generic yep. god. It's got. It's pretty wide. Okay. And that's why I want to add to the second point, because maybe some people are getting confused. He, you heard him say that the chief god of the Canaanites was El. I, I say El, so people don't think I'm saying the letter L. But isn't the true god of the Bible called El? Yeah, that's the point we're making. The term El, Il, or Elah, these are terms that were used for hosts of gods. So pagans could call their god El. And then the true believers, the Israelites, could call Yahweh Il. This is how it worked. It's similar to, I just want to make this point clear so you don't get confused. It's similar to the Greek word Theos for God. At the time of Jesus and the apostles, Zeus was called O Theos, O Pater, the God, the Father. Well, the mm -hmm. Father of Jesus was called Theos and Pater. So these terms could be used by different groups for different gods without having the same God in mind. So when you hear him saying El mm -hmm. of the Canaanites, he's not talking about Yahweh being called El. He's talking about their God because in the Canaanite pantheon, the chief God was El. He was called the father of gods. And certain descriptions, he had a huge, uh, huge member. He would have sex with goddesses and even women. And he had 70 sons, one of whom was Baal. Just keep that in mind. So go ahead, brother. Yeah. So even don't forget, even these guys in Yemen had the Qarab of El, Il, Il, right? Okay, moving on. So Abdul Muttalib was praying to Allah. Who was, okay, Abdul Muttalib, Muhammad was either not born at that point or was just born, was a young boy at best. Abdul Muttalib was praying to Allah. They brought near Abdullah 10 camels while, Abdullah, while Abdul Muttalib stood by Huba praying to Allah. Now, this is deliberately, tell me, this is deliberately written in a confusing manner. He's praying to Allah. Allah is called Hubal. So Muhammad's grandfather, Muhammad's whole family, prays to the Allah Hubal. They pray yep. to Baal. Okay? Yep. 
we'll continue. So they took before them, okay, they did this, and he took them before Hubal in the middle of the Kaaba. The statue of Hubal stood by a well, okay? It was that well in which gifts made to the Kaaba were stored. Now, beside Hubal, there were seven arrows. The original name of the Allah of the Kaaba was Hubal. The Allah of the Kaaba was called Hubal. Let's continue. Abdullah was Abdul Muttalib's favorite son. So hold on. Abdullah was the father of Muhammad, right? Abdul Muttalib was his grandfather. So this guy was called Abdullah. Abdullah meaning that he was the, he was the slave of Hubal, right? Hubal, we've just spoken about Hubal, what, what he, child sacrifice. He was the father of the apostle of Allah. The Allah happening at that point was Hubal. Abdul Muttalib stood by Hubal praying to Allah. Hubal being the god of Mecca. Okay, fine and well. And if you want to circumcise a boy or make a marriage or bury a body, they took him to Hubal. Hubal, the god Baal, he who is Baal. And then Abdul Muttalib took Muhammad before Hubal in the middle of the Kaaba where he stood and prayed to Allah, thanking him for this gift, which is Muhammad, the baby. And then he brought him out and delivered to his mother and he tried to find foster mothers for him. So when Muhammad was a baby, he was consecrated to Hubal. Because Hubal was the Allah of the Kaaba. Okay. <clears throat> and now notice, Zaid bin Amr stayed as he was, he accepted neither Judaism nor Christianity. He abandoned the religion of his people and abstained from idols, animals that had died, blood, and things offered to idols. Oddly enough, these are from the, from the seven laws of Noah, right? This is the covenant with the Jews prior to the Ten Commandments, so, which is the laws of Moses, right? So oddly enough, they are mentioning here, referencing directly the, the laws of Noah. And he forbade the killing of infants, okay, which is very, very unusual. And Zaid, not one of you follows the religion of Abraham, but I. So he's telling the Jews and the Christians and everyone else, you guys don't follow Abraham. I follow Abraham. We pray to the Allah of the Kaaba, who happens to be Hubal. So now they're claiming that, that Abraham followed Hubal. Okay. And here, am I to worship one Lord or a thousand? If there are as many as you claim, I renounce Alat and Al Uzza. Al Uzza and her two daughters. I will not worship Hubal, though he was our Lord in the days when I had little sense. So now Muhammad supposedly stops worshiping Hubal. Now, Muslims will claim high and low that Muhammad was born as a Muslim, blah, blah, blah. But within their own sources, Muhammad eventually says, hold on, I no longer worship Hubal, but I did for like 40 years. But now that I'm 40 years old, I've given that up, right? So I'll go on briefly. So as for the introduction of idolatry among the Arabs, the explanation currently in favor places responsibility in Amir bin Luhai. He allegedly brought back to Mecca from Syria an idol of Hubal. Yep. Now, there's more than one source for the story that in the third century, the statue of Hubal was brought from Syria and Hubal became the chief god of the Quraysh and of that area, supposedly Mecca. Your thoughts, Sam, before I go on? Yes, that's actually what I want you guys to do. If you go on my YouTube channel, search for Baal worship and go to my blog. I'll probably share the link. All what he's telling you is from Muslim sources. I wrote an article, did a session, quoting Ibn Kathir, Tabari, Ibn Ashaq. Everything he just said is from Muslim sources. He didn't quote Islamophobes. He didn't quote Christians or Jews. The Muslim sources are acknowledging Hubal was an idol imported from Syria by Amr ibn Luay, and he got it, and even says in one source, from the Moabites. Make that connection. The Moabites, Ammonites, Syria, they were notorious for worshiping Baal. If you want more proof that Hubal, he is Baal, is Baal, there you go. It comes from Syria. It was imported by the Moabites and brought to Mecca, proving that Hubal, he is Baal, 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 that's the same Baal that enticed Israelites to worship him instead of God. Same Baal that God had to constantly punish the Israelites for being enticed to worship. And now Baal is repackaged as Islam. Allah of Islam is Baal. It's Baal worship, Baal worship. But go ahead. And that's where we get Al, the god El, the Canaanite god, brought to Arabia now. Now, according to Abu Zaid and others, idolatry, notice what, notice what these Muslim sources say. Idolatry is not directly opposed to Tawheed. Since no one would be stupid enough to identify the creator with a piece of wood or with the piece of stone, right? But they notice the error of the idolaters is they suppose that God has a form. Now that unfortunately happens to be a very Gnostic, very hermetic 
very old idea that it's a sin to believe that God has a form because God is a monad, he's unknowable, God is distant. This is an entirely Neoplatonic slash Gnostic hermetic idea. So the era of idolatry is not to worship an idol, it is to believe that God has a form because God is unknowable, God is ineffable, not in the Christian sense, but in the Muslim sense, God lives far away in the Pleroma and he would never deign to come to the dirty world of matter. Let's continue. <clears throat> The origins of Hubal from the Smithsonian. The Nabataeans worshipped powerful female deities and they built lavish shrines in their honor. Archaeologists were stunned by the evidence for the worship of female deities in the ancient city of Petra long before the introduction of Islam. Now we're going back to Dan Gibson. The Nabataeans worshipped three female deities, Alat, the goddess, Al-Uzza, the powerful one, and Manat, the goddess of fate. Now look, when you read some sources, they are sisters in some, they're mother and daughters and Man, there could be fraternal uncles for all I know in a different source, but you'll find different views, okay? And and sometimes Alat is Aluza. They're actually the same goddess, two different names. So sometimes it's only two with three different names, right? So you'll find different sources that. Dr. Glenn Corbett from the American Center for Oriental Research in Jordan said the Nabataeans themselves who lived in Petra seem to have worshipped in particular the goddess Aluza, who is simply termed the mightiest. Okay, fine and well. So let's go to Arthur Jeffrey. The Quran mentions two prophets. It claims of prophets from infancy. Of John, we read in Quran 90 verse 13. Oh, John, take the book with strength. And we gave him al hukum okay, the prophetic office. Now, the hukum is, of course, we all know this, the hikma, right? Let's continue. The hikma, <clears throat> right? That's the hikma, the wisdom, right? The wisdom, right? The word hikma derives into Islam from a someone called um, Hirmis, okay? Hirmis is Hermes Trismegistus, right? Hermes Trismegistus is the Egyptian god, Thoth, okay, sorry. Hermes is the Egyptian god Thoth, it's the Greek god Hermes and the Roman god Mercury, right? This guy is the founder of, of course, Madame Blavatsky. If you've watched Helena Blavatsky, she's Hermes, sorry, Hermes Hikma, my bad. So, now, Hermes, okay, Hermes Trismegistus is the second prophet mentioned in Islam, the second prophet mentioned in the Quran, the very second. His name is Idris. Right? So Idris is the Egyptian god Thoth, who was combined with the Greek Hermes to become this, this god. But this is, this is a pagan god, supposedly, according to the sources, contemporary with Moses. And he brought the wisdom. He brought the wisdom of the ancients. So Idris in Islam, the second prophet mentioned in the Quran, is actually a pagan god. Uh, your thoughts, Sam, before I go on? <clears throat> so far, you've been confirming something I've said, that H Hubal, Baal, <clears throat> this is nothing more than Baal worship, and you're making the connections with all these gods and goddesses, because I think people may not understand. Uh, throughout the cultures, these gods and goddesses are actually mutations of the same gods and goddesses. So what we would call Zeus Someone else would call Baal or Jupiter. So you're yep. showing how it all converges and it becomes Allah of Islam. Keep in mind what he's doing. He's exactly. showing you all these clusters of gods and goddesses are now going to converge into Islam. So Allah is that Baal. Allah is that Zeus. Allah is that <clears throat> Jupiter. Allah is all these pagan gods. And that's exactly what one scholar 70 years ago stated. They rolled them all into one. Yes. Follow the so trail. So he says, I'm a servant of God. Nice. This is the Quran mentioning Jesus. He has given me the book and made me a prophet. Now, this is Jesus from the gospel of the infancy and the John of the Mandean Gnostic teachings. Now, hold on. This is These are words taken from the gospel of the infancy, the Arabic gospel of the infancy, a known Gnostic text. This is not Orthodox Christianity. This is word for word lifted, plagiarized from the Gnostic gospels. And of course, we already saw that the, the Menim <clears throat> are the Mandaeans who are by no means Christians. They hate Christianity, but they were called Christians for some reason by the Muslims, right? Allah says to Muhammad, did he not find thee an orphan and give thee shelter? Find thee wandering in error and guide thee. Of course, now they want to claim in error it just means he was without parents or whatever. So the word Dalan and Hada make it obvious that the reference is to his being found by Allah in a false religion and then guided to the true as the older exegetes recognized. Later efforts by modern apologists are to claim that to claim this is being taken into his grandfather's home. So they're trying to whitewash 
the fact that Muhammad was actually worshipping pagan gods. Now, few details of Muhammad's domestic life with his first wife Khadija are preserved, but there's a passage in the Musnad of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, one of the founders of the four schools of fiqh, who is a sheikh al Islam, not, not just a sheikh al Islam, who is a um, who is a mujtahid mutlaq, in other words, perfect, absolute scholar, which mentions their custom of evening prayer. In this tradition, a neighbor of Muhammad's and Khadija says, he overheard Muhammad saying to his wife, O oh Khadija, by Allah, I will not worship Allah, nor al Uzza, by Allah, I will not perform worship to Allah and al Uzza again. But Khadija said, Leave Allah and leave al Uzza. The neighbor adds, These were their idols which they used to worship and then go to bed. This is in the Muslim sources by one of the foremost founders of the schools of faith. Right. <clears throat> So in Kitab al-Badi, blah, 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 al-Naqdisi, according to the ancient authority of al-Qatada, the first son Khadija bore to Muhammad in the Jahiliya was named Abd Manaf, the servant of Manaf. Who is Manaf? Well, we're going to find out that Manaf is a star god. He's one of the pagan gods in the pantheon, the, the, the child of the moon and the star, right? So, of the moon and the sun, right? Manaf was an ancient idol venerated by the Quraysh, one of the most important divinities at Mecca. So Muhammad named a son, according to Islamic tradition, after a pagan god. Manaf, pre-Islamic god, worshipped among the Quraysh and other tribes of Northwest Arabia. Okay, from that, so we know this from Muslim scholars. Okay, he was an astral deity. His idols were located in the Kaaba. Okay, fascinating. Okay, Manat, Manaf and Manat, the male and female. Now, they might be brother and sister, or they might be complementaries, opposites. They could well be the same god, just sometimes they gender swap. Important female deity of the pre-Islamic period. She's usually associated with Alat and Al-Uzza as the daughters of Allah. Evidence from the Near East show this goddess was very ancient. The name appears in Akkadian. And one of the names associated with her is Ishtar. Ishtar also happens to be Manaf. Ishtar, we've, we'll, we've, we've meant, covered her before. We'll come back to her again. In Palmyra, Palmyra she's a seated deity holding a scepter. She's the goddess of fate. Didn't we just show that previously the goddesses of Nabatea she was a goddess of fate, right? In Arabia, her worship location was close to Yatrib, which we know as Medina. Okay, she was worshipped by the two Arab tribes of the city. Okay, she was linked with Alat and Al-Uzza. Okay, by a federation of the cult by the Meccans and Ugaritic. Now we're going back to Syria now. Ugaritic evidence has three linked female deities as the daughters of Baal. Okay, so if you want to say anything, Sam, just jump in at yes. any time. Okay. okay? Yep. Guys, follow the path, follow the trail, because this has nothing to do with Islam. He's a pagan. Don't believe him. Did you hear what he just said? And this is actually documented. Alat al Uzza Manat, the daughters of Baal, Baal, in the Ugaritic pantheon, because they found tablets at Ugarit, this is in Syria, which are ancient and gives us an idea of what the beliefs of the people were at the time of Abraham. <clears throat> so they found Ibla tablets, Nutsi tablets. So this evidence has uncovered the names of many of these gods and goddesses that we know from Islam, showing you that these gods and goddesses were there before Islam. Now do the math. If Alat al Uzza Manat are the daughters of Baal, Baal, I'll say Baal for people that say Baal. Mm -hmm. But then the Muslim sources say Alat al Uzza Manat were the daughters of Allah. And who Baal, who Baal was the chief god of Mecca, he would have been Allah. You now have more irrefutable proof. Baal is who Baal, and who Baal is the Allah of Mecca and the Kaaba. And that's why Alat al Uzzamanat, the daughters of Baal, were believed to be the daughters of Allah. So Islam is Baal worship. And Baal is one of the names of Satan, according to scripture. But I just want to re-emphasize yes. that we're making. So, so yeah, so understand, this is this is solid. I mean, this is solid archaeology. There's no, there's, this is not, this is not supposition. This is like, this is solidly tested. Okay, let's continue. So the symbol for al makka the Sabaean moon god, al makka was king of the gods. Now look, within the Yemeni Arabic, he had a, a softer Q son, al makka Whereas when it went to Arabia, it became al makkah makkah right the sound changed the ka became ka right he was king of the gods similar to the mesopotamian moon god nana also known as shin or nanar or nana shwen one of the oldest deities in the mesopotamian pantheon al makkah was the main god for yemen and aksum 
before Christianity with Shamash, the sun god. Somalians also worshipped al Makkah, though some Somalis and Kushites worshipped Wak. Wak happens to be al Makkah too. Okay, let's just, it's all the same god. Okay, now I want you to have a look. This is the symbol of al Makkah. You will see a crescent and a star. Here you'll see just the crescent. Okay, but it's probably got nothing to do with Islam, right? That there's a crescent and a star here, Sam. Nothing. Just sheer coincidence, right? They just... Nothing. Whatsoever. I mean, You're nothing. just a sucker, and you are a gossiper, and you are a munafik and a kafir. Nothing to do with Islam. You've, you've convinced me to become Muslim. I was getting worried for a moment because, because you know, Muslims and us, we worship the same God, and they love Jesus. So, Wait, so yeah, I just I was getting don't? worried for a moment. Yeah. You're telling me they don't? They don't worship the same God? They don't have the same Jesus? Man, no, no, you that's are what they told me. They, they assure me. I'm, you know, so let's move on. Let's move on. Nabonidus, Temple of Shin, Nana. So Nabonidus glorified Shin. Shin replaced the previous god, okay, Marduk. Marduk was Jupiter, right? And of course, we have his son. Now, some say it might not have been his biological son, but it could have been like he adopted or someone he was very close to or whatever, but whatever, okay? His son was Belshazzar. Belshazzar is, as you mentioned last time, he's mentioned the book of Daniel, okay? When Daniel, the finger on the wall, right? So he lived 10 years in Tema, Saudi Arabia. So maybe we should go there. Maybe I should just bring up the map. <clears throat> okay, let me go to Google Earth and we'll go to Tema. Okay, so Tema, Saudi Arabia is, is up here somewhere. Here, Tema. Tema, oddly enough, is also known as Yemen. Where, where the heck is Yemen? Oh, Yemen is down here. It's just that happens to be just, just their way of saying Yemen. Tema happens to be called Yemen. Isn't that just a strange coincidence? It's got nothing to do with Islam, fortunately. So he lived here in Tema, which is, now it is, it is said that his influence extended and he traveled down to Medina, okay? But he lived here for 10 years, right? So in this part of Arabia, right? So he lived here and he also called Yemen, Yemen. In fact, when I was in, when I lived in the Middle East, so, some of the Arabs would say Yemen. They wouldn't say Yemen. They would say Yemen, like, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. though, okay. yeah, man. Just like when they say Abu Umama, that means the father of your mama. But go ahead. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. So, you come, uh, don't confuse me with facts, Sam. I have a small brain. I'm coping here. So, Yemen. Yeah, now, look, if you go through the sources, you'll find different spellings of the names. So, Yemen yeah, is a large oasis with a long history of settlement. Okay. And this is where the trade routes cross. Okay. This was 350 Ks north of Medina. It was a center of moon worship. Jeez, what a coincidence. He was son-in-law of King Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know why they renamed him this guy to King Simon or King Frank or King something. Easy name, but okay, fine. King Nebuchadnezzar. Small, probably nothing to do with history or the Bible. His mother was high priestess of Shin in Haran, his daughter at Ur, we covered last week. This is the old temple, the old temple of magic, right? In Ur. Okay, in Haran, sorry. Abraham's origin is in Ur, don't forget, in Haran, okay? So we discussed that already in brief. The word Yatrib appears in an inscription found in Haran, Turkey, belonging to the Babylonian king Nabonidus. Hmm. So he was probably in Yatrib, and his influence extended at least down to Medina today, right? So this is what they controlled. They controlled the area all the way down to Medina. And I mean, I'm not going to say that they could not or would not have gone down to Mecca, but somehow they Yatrib existed. Okay, this was the area of influence here. This was the fertile crescent. <clears throat> Nabonidus, 556 to 539 BC. He was the last king of Babylon, of the Sumerian Mesopotamian cultures. He was related to Nebuchadnezzar. He had a childhood, childhood in Sabian, Haran, in Turkey, a major site of worship for the moon god Sin. He was called the first archaeologist. We need to check what that was about. He rearranged the Babylonian pantheon pantheon of gods he kicked marduk or jupiter out huh. he's pictured here on an engraving in saudi arabia notice here he's wearing a little wizard's cap and he's got his staff like moses right here's the little crescent and here's the star huh. and here's the snake <laughs> wow okay we'll continue this often is a sun this is often a sun disc with wings right that's also egyptian right so he's a wizard now they'll trace the Partly, this is to trace themselves back to Egyptian lineage and that of the Hikma of Hermes Trismegistus. Okay, 
So he lived in Tema, Saudi Arabia, for 10 years. And Shin is the father of the gods and the god of, and the, oh my gosh, what am I doing these days? I need to have a look at them. Let me just go back here. Wow. So his mother and daughter were priests of Sin, huh? Yes, priests of Sin. Isn't that odd? Wow, Sin. Now, if you guys don't remember Sin, besides being something bad that we shouldn't do, Sin, breaking God's law, Sin is the moon god. Did you catch it? Nebuchadnezzar' mother was a priestess of the moon god Sin, and his daughter was a priestess of the moon god Sin. So you see Nebuchadnezzar was steeped in moon worship, but where was moon worship prevalent? Arabia. Guys, are you listening? Let me hammer yes. this point. Brethren, are you listening? Nebuchadnezzar spent 10 years in Arabia because he wanted to worship the moon god, showing you moon god was prevalent in Arabia. And this is long before the birth of Christ. Right. So I'll continue here. So notice, okay, he lived in Arabia for 10 years. So he brought, he imported his religion. So he deposed Marduk, Jupiter, and he started to worship Shin. And he spread it all across the region, right? And he lived in Arabia. So Shin is the father of the gods and the god of wisdom. And he was worshipped in Iran until the arrival of Islam. Okay. Crescent flag moons, crescent moon flags, sorry, in the region are traced back to Shin. Remember, we opened up with how many crescent moon flags there are in the Islamic pantheon, including the symbol of Satan, right? The witch's star, right? The pentagram. And these are all traced, apparently, to the origin being that of the moon god Shin. So the Arabian flags trace their origin to the source. Notice you've got the disc, the crescent, and the star. The disc, the crescent, and the star. Notice there was a trinity of gods, okay, a trinity of pagan gods. He had the winged feathered sun disc and Shamash, the god of justice and morality. And he had the seven-pointed star, sometimes the five-pointed star, called Ishtar, the goddess of sex, love, and war. That's going to be important. War. So this is Venus, Aphrodite, Ashtoreth, Attar, Attar. Wait, hold Occasionally. On. You said that's Venus? Yes. Where, where's Venus? Okay, well, that, what's my ex-fiance doing there? Why you got my ex-fiance there? But go ahead. Her name was Venus. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Started to bring up bad memories. Let's continue. This is him again. Notice you've got the star and the crescent. So he, Nebuchadnezzar, who worshipped the moon god Sin, was associated with the star and the crescent and the sun. And we'll find the sun in Islam as well. We're going to get there. In fact, you know what? I'm going to go there now just so that we can have a look at something in advance. I'm going to skip ahead. We're on slide number 87. So let me just jump ahead here and go find something for you guys here. I want to bring up the following. Okay. I want to show you something. This is the Kaaba. These doors are the doors of the Kaaba. Notice the sun symbol, the sun and the moon symbol. Okay. This is the sun and the moon symbol. There's more to that. I'm going to go find you one more thing, which we're going to get to in the future. I want you to look here. Okay. This, this is the Kaaba. Notice the Hatim here. Now, when you look from the top, I want you to notice three poles in the middle, three poles. Okay. We'll get to all that symbolism. These are the stars. These lamps are the stars. Sam, does this look like a half moon? Does this look like a crescent yeah, well, of the moon? You know, it's funny. Someone just sent me a video. I'm going to send it to you. <clears throat> a Muslim went on a live stream when he saw that picture. And he was yelling at another Muslim saying, why are you here debating Christians? You see they're making fun of the Kaaba. They placed it next to a toilet. He thought that was an actual toilet. It was a fabricated photo where someone attached the Kaaba to a toilet because it looked like a toilet bowl. <laughs> I got the video. It's a short video yeah. that you see some getting angry. Saying, hey, they're yeah. mocking the Kaaba. They're putting the Kaaba next to the toilet. And the Christians yeah. say, no, dude, that's the actual Kaaba. This is the Kaaba. It does look like a toilet. I mean, yeah. Yeah. This is the interior of the Kaaba. This has been changed over and over. It no longer looks. But I want you to notice, okay, this is astrological. We're going to get to this in the future, but this is astrological. This is the center that doesn't move here. You see? This is the moon, and these are the stars that move the children, the children of the moon and the sun that move around, you see? And I want you to notice, here's your moon. This is the center, right? Notice the big disc here. This is the sun. That's the symbolism here. Right? Wow, okay, so... Point. Uh, guys, did you catch it? Uh, I don't know if you guys are understand. I don't mean to come up. I want this to sink in and rewatch this and upload this, learn this stuff. You see that circle? That's the sun. 
Within it was the moon. If you want more proof that Islam is nothing more than astral pagan worship, worship of gods and goddesses and the sun, moon, and stars, he just showed you. That was shaped like a moon, a sun, and in it was the moon. There you go. Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of this stuff. Okay, so let me try and run through how far do we go. Okay, so let me continue. So I uh, made myself disappear. Okay, so Anunit. Anunit was an Assyrian or Chaldean goddess, worshipped by the early monarchs, okay, kings. She is supposed to have resembled the Venus of the Greeks. Anunit was also a star which was identified by the Assyrians with Ishtar. Now, Anunit, this Chaldean goddess, is Ishtar, the daughter of the moon god Shin. Okay, fine. Now, all these gods are starting to connect. They all seem to be from the same pantheon. Different names, different places, same gods. Cyrus, an account is given by Nabonidus of his restoration of the temple of the moon god at Haran and the temples of the sun god and of Anunit at Sepravaim. Okay, so the god of Sepravaim was Adram Malek, Adram Malek, Annam Malek, 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 Abdal Malek, Moloch. Right, let's continue. Tema's influence, Sin and Hadramaz. So Tema's position may have forced or stimulated the other town states of Arabia to partake to some degree in the civilization that, that he brought, that Nabonidus brought, okay? But they also tried to preserve or reestablish their independence. Fine and well. Typo, not mine. I think. So different scripts were used and developed. Even the clansmen of the nomadic tribes knew how to write. Now that's an odd statement. So apparently Arabia was very, very literate pre-Muhammad. For a thousand years before Muhammad, these traders were highly literate. They had writing. Okay. Now, an interesting, there are several important archaeological sites on the coast of the Arab Persian Gulf. On the continent alone, the most significant are blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And surviving documents are written in Aramaic. Okay. And Aramaic was the mother tongue of part of the population, especially the elites. A large number of Aramaic speaking churchmen and religious authors in the Nestorian church came from the Gulf. My ancestors. The text, yeah, and the text in Sabaean scripts were relatively common. Okay, so the Sabaeans, the Yemenis, were writing a lot, and they controlled Arabia. In the Gulf, as in the north of the Ijaz, texts in foreign languages, Akkadian, Imperial Aramaic, Nabataean Greek, Latin are common. <clears throat> in southern Arabia, where five inscriptions have been found in Ge'ez, or classical Ethiopian, two in Hebrew, three Sabaic, Nabataean. Oh, the Sabaeans and the Nabataeans were talking to each other? The people in Petra and the people from Yemen were talking. That's interesting. So bilinguals in Sabaic and Nabataean, there was a Greek-Latin one. Oh, the Greek and Latin language in, in, in okay. Arabia. One inscription in Greek, one in Nabataean, one in Palmyrenian, and also some graffiti in Greek, Nabataean and Palmyrenian, and also Indian and Gez graffiti in Socotra. In Socotra. Oh, my golly, that's odd. So you've got a profusion. Here's Socotra down here, if I recall. This is Socotra down here. This is Yemen. This is Sokotra, here's Mecca. That's Sokotra there, if I'm, if I'm correct. So now, what we're learning is there was a profusion of languages, like a dozen languages in that region, loads of writing, loads of inscriptions. Then Muhammad comes along and suddenly everyone's illiterate. Yeah. Somehow, all of a sudden, nobody can write nothing. And then for 200 years, there's like nothing. And then suddenly all these hadith appear out of nowhere. Exactly. Your thoughts, Sam? Now, by the way, guys, there's a scholar who's done intense excavation in southern northern Arabia. His name is Ahmad El Jalad. I mentioned yeah. him in previous sessions. Ahmad El Jalad. He is an academic and archaeologist. He and other teams have excavated southern and northern Arabia. He was featured by Gabriel Sayed Reynolds. Everything he told you, everything he said, confirmed by him, they found inscriptions predating Islam starting at the 4th century AD and by the time of the end of the 5th century and start of 6th century. And he shows they were literate in these areas because he documents so many inscriptions and even confirms that the Nabataeans had, were bilingual and that some of their inscriptions were in Aramaic, later evolved to what they call Nabataean Arabic and Greek. So this claim that the Arabs were illiterate is destroyed by archaeology and by someone who professes to be a Muslim, Ahmad El Jalad. Everything he's telling you confirmed. And he also confirmed that all the inscriptions in Arabia, Southern Arabia, Northern Arabia, demonstrated by the end of the 5th century, start of 6th century, the Arabs had all of a sudden become monotheistic. They no longer mentioned the gods and goddesses. That ended by the end of the 5th century, start of 6th century, they're all monotheistic, worshipping El-Ilah, 
And some of these descriptions that worshipped al Ilah had crosses showing their Christian influence. This is independent, historical, archaeological inscriptions that have been uncovered to confirm Islamic version of history is a lie. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. No, so I mean, look, this is my own stuff. I, I was aware of very little of what al Jalad had to say. But I mean, the, the fact that he corroborates what I'm saying here, I mean, he's a, he's in a full okay. academic with staff and a, and a, and a budget. You know? yeah. So read his articles on Academia as a page. He gives you detailed evidences. They came up with a book. So he's confirmed what you've been saying <clears throat> independently from him, from your own study. And he's found the inscriptions, him and other teams. He's not the only one. Yeah. Uh, so someone asked, what are the three pillars in the Kaaba? I can only guess. We'll get to that later, okay? I can give you my best guess. So, um, so moving on. In the early polytheistic period, the earlier polytheistic period, the Hadrami pantheon, the Yemeni pantheon, shows a close similarity to other South Arabian areas dominated by the astral triad or trinity of moon, sun, and Venus star, except that the moon god in Hadramat bore the distinctive name Shin, borrowed from the Babylonian religion. He is commonly referred to as Shin of Illum. Hold on, hold on. He's commonly referred to as Silum. Shin of Illum. Shin of Illum. I wonder if that's familiar. I wonder if sh Shin of Illum. Okay, probably no connection to Silum. So, okay, fine. He's commonly referred to as Shin of Illum, right? And it has been conjectured that the latter term is the, is the name of the principal deity, principal shrine of this deity. Islam. Okay, fine. So, Arabian languages and a number of foreign tongues were used in this land. Akkadian documents, Greek texts, and also Hellenistic period from the islands of Phylaka and Bahrain. I've been to Bahrain. Even Latin rock inscriptions have been found in Arabia. It is only the Aramaic language, together with the script, that is, that is attested with frequency, proven by a growing corpus of texts, coins, bronze plaques, and pot shards, the surviving correspondence in Aramaic, known as Syriac, between church authorities. So in other words, people are finding more and more this was a highly literate, Nabataean and Palmyrenian. This was a highly literate society until the Muslims came along and quite literally destroyed everything to hide wow. the history. Wow. Sad, now, man. Haran, the home of the patriarchs. There's a village of Haran today in Turkey. Remember, we've shown you where Haran is. It is here. If you go up to Turkey, it's up here by Gobekli Tepe, right? just above Syria, right, where the world's oldest archaeology, the world's oldest temples are. So the village of Haran exists in Turkey, atop of the ancient one from the Old Testament period. Found near Haran are villages that bear the names of Abraham's great-grandfather and his grandfather, Serug and Nahor. Haran was the father of Lot. The cities of Ur and Haran both had the moon god as their main deity. Terra, okay, Azhar, was the father of Abraham, worshipped other gods. And he moved his family from Ur to Haran. Arabia and all the princes of Kedad, they were the merchants of the hand in lambs and rams and goats, and in these they were their merchants. The traffickers of Sheba, so these people from Yemen are mentioned in the Bible more than once. Remember, they were the servants of Satan. They attacked Lot on the behest of Satan. Lot's family, right? They were thy traffickers. They traded for thy wares with chief of all spices and with all precious stones and gold. Haran and Canaan, Eden, right? The traffickers of Sheba, right? So they are known in the Bible. This is a biblical reference, all right? And we can find them referenced to it. So now let's have a quick look here. Haran. So what it seems to be of great importance for the cultural and religious development of the quote-unquote Arabs, and they put the quotes around it, that Nabonidus of Babylonia conquered Tamar in 550 BC from the Encyclopedia of Islam, that somehow Nabonidus had a strong influence on the religious development of the Arabs. He reigned for eight years and made an expedition as far as Yathrib. So he went as far as Yathrib, just above Mecca, right? He built a palace and temple in Tema and made the place the center of a religion and cult around the Aramean moon god Shin, perhaps with the sun disk resting in the crescent as the main symbol of this religion, with the crescent inside of a disk, of the, sorry, with the, with the, with the disk in, inside of a crescent. There should be investigations on the close resemblances between this cult and that of South Arabia and Ethiopia. Hold on. Now you've got this, and these guys control this region. Okay, Shin was the state god of Hadramaut since the earliest inscriptions of this state. So the moon god Shin and this guy, so this whole region, including Mesopotamia, Ethiopia, all worship the same god Shin. This whole region, this whole area. Okay, all of it. So, right, so now we're, we're proving over and over that, that 
the wor- the worship of the moon god Shin was the predominant religion, right? Elam, name given to the moon god by the southern Hebrews. Variants of Elam were Era, Etera, hold on, Ilmaka, Jera, Shahar, and Tera. My gosh, Tera, Ilmaka, the name of Abraham's father, Azhar, in the Quran, is also al Makkah, which happens to be the moon god, Sin. Sam, do you have any thoughts you want to add? I mean, you seem to have a look there that's like, yeah, I'm, I, to continue. I'm, I'm looking at the people to see if they're going to understand, if they're focusing, why they're getting gold, if you're paying attention, like this sister is getting it. These should be taught in Greek theological universities. What a presentation. If you guys are listening, he's giving you archaeological inscriptions, evidence that has been furnished, documented, that are undeniable by people in the field who have studied these regions who are not Islamophobes. And if you're paying attention, you got to pay attention here. Did you hear that the worship of sin was prevalent throughout Arabia and also Babylon and also in Ethiopia, so that here you have now irrefutable evidence, the dominant deity worshipped in this region, especially Arabia, is the moon god. Brethren, you need to listen to this. This is why I'm saying this is based on solid historical, textual, archaeological evidences, inscriptions that do not care about your religion. And these are scholars who are not Christians. Many of them are not Christians. They could care less about Christianity. They're simply stating the facts. And one reason why it's not as well known, and I'm just going to make this comment because I want you to have all the time, is because the academics are afraid for their life. I want you to understand this. Many academics know that moon worship is prevalent in Arabia and that Islam is nothing but a hodgepodge of pagan moon worship combined with heretical forms of Judaism, Christianity, but they cannot say it because they'll either be killed or they will lose their job because many universities are funded by generous, generous donations from Saudi Arabia. So they know this stuff, but they're not making it accessible on the popular level, which is why people like Lloyd are blessing to the church because the Lord is putting in his heart to not make it accessible to the lay person. Don't take advantage of the blessings of the Lord through his servants. And go to his channel, subscribe, and support him. <laughs> the link to his channel is in the YouTube, in the description box. Go ahead, brother. Okay, so so yeah, there's a, there's a point I want to get to. So let me just run ahead. There's a point I want to get to with this, something that's going to be very interesting. So, so okay, so we've got Ilmakka, Tera, the name of Abraham's father, Ilmakka. Okay, now, now we're getting to Makkah again. We're back to Makkah, back to this guy. Yam, the Babylonian sea god, was killed by Baal with two clubs fashioned by Qatar. Now, if you go look up the name of the country, Qatar, and you try and find where the heck does the name of this country comes from, they'll tell you, well, you know, no one really knows. It's a mystery, you know. We, we think it means something to do with water, but, but that's the best we can tell you. It's something to do with water. But otherwise, nobody knows where Qatar comes from. No one knows what Qatar means. Well, Qatar happens to be the name of a pagan god, okay? So Yam was the Babylonian sea god killed by Baal with two clubs fashioned by Qatar Wahasis. Qatar Wahasis is a maker god, second tier god. Okay, a maker god called he made a weapon called driver and expeller. This is similar to another myth from another from the Greek pantheon, I think. With driver, he was struck on the body and driven from his throne. With expeller, he was struck on the head. No Mesopotamian. There's another myth from the Mesopotamian that's similar. He was struck on the head and driven from the seat of his authority. And terra also means ibex. So the word Qatar. I seriously, you try and find the meaning of the word Qatar. Where does the name of the country Qatar comes from? The only thing you can find is this god, this pagan god. So the country is named, as far as I can tell, after a pagan god. <clears throat> Terra means ibex, which in ancient, ancient times was the well-known moon symbol because of the crescent here. Okay? And Egerton Sykes wrote that Terra was a theophoric name. Okay? Uh, basically a holy name. Terra. Ancient Semitic name for the moon. Equated with Terra, father of Abraham. The moon was known as Etera and Jera, who were also known as al -Makkah. Okay, al Makkah is called the master of the Ibex, or the lord of the Ibexes, which was the symbol of the moon. Okay, Abraham's younger brother was named after the city Haran. Haran was the ancient city of the moon. The name Haran seems to have become a theophoric name, synonymous with the moon god Sin. The temple of Bilqis, the queen of Sheba, 
was a moon god temple, which in fact misled the Arabs to think that Solomon's god, Yahweh, was a moon god. Right, so the, these things just start tripping over each other. The connection is just like, it's just there's no escaping this moon godness, right? I'll continue. So you, And here we've called, of course, this is the best book in the topic by Bill Tamara Green, the city of the moon god, discussing the religious traditions of Haran in Turkey. And of course, where's the another Haran? In Mecca, where? where Makaraba is, right? <clears throat> the Sabians of Iran in the classical tradition, and they speak of astrology and astral magic, okay? These were the sciences of that era. Magic was a science then, right? The Greek philosophical and scientific material available to them was mingled with elements from ancient Mesopotamia, India, Iran, Judaism, and Egypt to form a syncretic system of magical belief that they could claim to be mankind's original and authentic religion. Right. So now let's read about this book. This study treats. Now, this is the book that I mentioned here. OK, this book here. This study treats the religious and intellectual history of the city of Iran in eastern Turkey from biblical times down to the establishment of Islam. The author starts from the well-known reference in the Quran and the early Islamic histories of the people of Iran known as Sabians, one of the quote unquote peoples of the book. We know these people were Mandeans. We know these people were not Christian. They were Gnostics at best. Right. The author unravels strands of religious tradition in Haran that run from the old Semitic planetary cults through Hellenistic Hermeticism, right, Hermes Trismegistus, Gnosticism, and Neo-Pythagoreanism, and Christian cults to esoteric Islamic sects such as the Sufis and Shiites. And they speak of, again, I'll repeat, astral magic, the Greek philosophical and scientific material. So when the so basically the Muslims invaded this place and they took over the Sabian. So <clears throat> the Muslims took over Haran, and there they found this old magical tradition. Okay, these people claim to have inherited the wisdom of the ages from from Hermes Trismegistus. So the Muslims took all this and eventually ended up in Spain. They took this knowledge to Spain, but they mixed all these elements of ancient Mesopotamian magic, India, Iran, okay, occult Judaism, and Egypt. That's Hermes to form a syncretic system of belief that they claimed was mankind's original and authentic religion. What were the Muslims doing? Looking for mankind's original and authentic religion. Son. You're, 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 you're blocked the uh, sound. No sound. No Sorry sound. about that. I thought I lost yeah. you for a minute. Like, what happened to you, Lloyd? Don't disappear. Did the genies attack your sound system? <clears throat> you Sorry can, about you that. You don't believe the distractions in the comment section because when satan hates a subject and hates people who are exposing him and his religion he will send trolls to distract or cause distractions like nicodemus and michael ringer won't stop distracting me as i'm trying to focus and i'm on the verge of blocking people see i have a virus uh, Lloyd, it's called blockitis when people can't behave and control themselves and want intention and then okay. i send them back to mecca so that I can be cured of my itch. But go ahead, brother. I'm trying to focus and learn because I'm learning new stuff as well because this is new to me. But you think these brethren can control and constrain themselves like one guy's advertising. Okay. So look have... to the audience. Is this all making sense? That now the world's oldest religion in Haran with the world's oldest temples in Haran was a mixture of all of the esoteric magical cults from all around the world, the known world at that time. <clears throat> Understand? And of course, Haran was known as the city of the moon. So this moon god cult was a cult with magical worship with everything mixed in. Let's continue. And these are the Sabians, right? Remember, these Sabians are in the Quran mentioned as the people of the book. These Sabians who have a mixture of Mesopotamian moon god worship and magic, Indian magic, Iranian magic, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, like occult Judaism, we're talking about Kabbalah and stuff, Egypt, Hermes Trismegistus, okay, the, and the, the god Thoth, Right, and and this is supposed to be the people of the book. These are supposed to be quote unquote Christians to the Muslims. This makes no sense. This is the seriously. These Muslims have snookered themselves behind the eight ball for this. All right, the term El. I'm just. I'm not going to go through this too much, but the term El is common. You have Ilu and Il. Of course, we also know that within the Yemeni, we also had Il. Okay, generic word for God. A generic word for God in the Semitic languages. Right. And it is used over 200 times in the Old Testament, often as a modifying term with it, okay? So El was the chief and somewhat vague shadowy god of the Canaanite pantheon. 
And the title is used in the Old Testament to express the exalted transcendence of God. See the word Elohim. Now the Hebrews borrowed this word from the Canaanites. And the linguistic derivation of the name is uncertain, but some suggestions include roots that mean to be strong and to be in front of, like a leader. Now the Canaanite god El was the father of human beings and of gods. He was called the father of mankind and the father of years. He was immortal, but he was immoral, a debased character, an utterly debased character. So, according to the scholarship here, it is a tribute to the very high morality of the Old Testament understanding of God that a title that in Canaanite usage was so defiled, so filthy, so dirty, could without risk be used to express the moral majesty of the God of Israel. This was a deliberate choice because I am the Lord God. I am the only high God. I am the only true God. So God says that title belongs to me, not to these false gods. So they had defiled the title, and God says, no, I claim this as my own, right? So just as the word God in English can be used of the true God or of false gods, this word in Hebrew may refer to heathen gods, usually meaning idols. Let's continue. <clears throat> now, this term, El, okay, you'll find it in the Sabaean, in the Assyrian, Illu, Nabataean, Sabaean, Pomeranian, Phoenician, and Alat. Now we find Alat is also found here. This is from the Assyrian Alatu, and of course it's going to have its links into the Arabic as well. These are, notice, but this El also becomes Baelim, Baelim, Bael, Kael, Kal. Kal is one of the gods in that region of Ethiopia, right, from one of the, from the African side, Kal. We've seen Wak, same god, right? Baelim, right? So these terms are all related. They are not separate gods. They are one god. Different names, different titles, same God. Let's continue. Baal, Hubal, and Aterat. In Israelite religion, Yahweh replaced the great God El as Israel's God. Okay? And of course, we read here of, they ignored Yahweh, their God, and worshipped Baalim, plural of Baal, and Asherot, Atherat, plural of Asherah. Right? The consort of Baal, Asherah, the female consort, the sun. Right? Now, they mention here, King Ahab to summon on Mount Carmel and 450 prophets of Baal, and 400 prophets of Asherah. Again, Asherah is associated with the god Baal. This time, the Asherah. Now, what is odd? Now, this is very weird. You have Baal, the masculine. Okay. You have Baal. And then, of course, what is the feminine of Baal? Is Baala. Baala, the Baala. The feminine of Baal is the Baala. Your thoughts on that, Sam? <clears throat> I muted myself. It's interesting. You're finding the feminine form of Baal, Baala, because the Muslims admit there's a feminine form of Allah. It's Alat. So, yeah, there's interesting how you can take names of masculine deities and feminize them, either because it had, they have a feminine counterpart or they have feminine characteristics, because even Muslims like Ibn Kathir say Allah was feminized into Alat, and his name Al-Aziz was feminized into Al-Uzza, and one of his names, Al Manan, was feminized into Al Manat. So interesting, you would bring that up. Yeah. So the the Israelites the Israelites had to burn these things. Okay. So the famous site of Ugarit on the Syrian coast had a cache of 14th to 13th century BC cuneiform tablets that are the main source for understanding pre-Israelite Canaanite religion. Okay. And they speak of Atherat, the consort of the great god El. Atherat is the Ugaritic linguistic equivalent equivalent of the Hebrew Asherah. So now you've got the male god, the moon, with the female god, the sun. Now notice, this is the pagan kinda kingdom, okay? These kinda from this region, they invaded and they took over this whole region here, possibly up as far as here, up and towards the borders of Israel, okay? So these guys shifted upwards north. This was their, this was their headquarters here, their main city. Still exists today. And don't forget, it's older than Mecca, okay? Muslim sources agree that the Hadramaut, that's the region on the bottom, right? Yemen was the origin, original homeland of the tribe of Kinda, a nomadic offshoot of what was founded as the Central Arabian Kingdom of Kinda, the Kindat al-Muluk. Okay, so these guys were the Kindat al-Muluk, the Kindat of the Muluk, okay? Back to the whole Malik, Muluk thing. We cannot, okay, so the totality of Inia Arabia, so these guys controlled the totality of Inia Arabia up to the vicinity of lower Iraq and perhaps even Palestine. So these guys, the Kindat al-Muluk, controlled almost all of Arabia Palestine, even up to Iraq. The capital city still stands today, southeast of Makkah, as I mentioned. The capital city stands here. Qariyat al-Faw. Okay, the Qariyat al-Faw still stands there, right? 
<clears throat> the gods they worshipped include Kaal, Kael. We just mentioned that Kaal was Baal, was El, was it's all the same god. Kaal, Kael. Okay. Atar al Sharik, and they worshipped a god called La. Interesting. They worshipped a god called La. Allah the La. Okay, they worship the god called La. And rising from the east, Sharik is a reference to the sun. That means companion or partner, which we know is the companion to the moon god. South Arabian inscriptions from the 4th, 4th to 5th century AD refer to a god called, now this is interesting, Rahman, the merciful one who had a monotheistic cult and was referred to as the lord of heaven and earth. Rahman, that's fascinating. Aaron Hughes states that the scholars are unsure whether he developed from the earlier polytheistic systems or developed due to the increasing significance and influence of the Christian and Jewish communities. Because Rahman was the original name for the god Yahweh used by the Christians in Arabia, used by the Jews in Arabia. So the Christians and Jews in Arabia used to call the god of the Christians and Jews Rahman. The upper classes went over to some form of monotheistic creed in the 6th century, right? A cult of the merciful, the Rahmanan, the Lord of Heaven, which could perhaps, perhaps, perhaps best be described as Hanafite, see Hanif. Now we know that Hanif are Hanpa, known as, or Hanpa, as you said, which are heretics. They are the Hmanim. They had, they followed the cult of Rahman, who is a corruption of the God of the Bible. These are corrupt Jews and Christians. These are heretics. Sam, is this starting to make sense? Yeah, okay. I just want to hammer one point about the Rahman title. Uh, I want you guys to understand, in in South Arabia, Rahman was a name for a pagan god. Pay attention to his <clears throat> inscript, his references, because he's trying to cover a lot of material, but I don't want you to miss it. The pagans in South Arabia called one of their chief gods, pagan gods, Rahman. But the Jews and Christians were also using the word Rahmanan, Rahmanan, the N at the end, making it definite, the Rahman. In reference for the true God. However, that doesn't mean they're worshiping the same God. And according to Muslim sources, and I can do something on this later unless he has them, when Muhammad started calling Allah Rahman, it says the pagans in Mecca said, we don't know who this Rahman is. We don't know who, who you're talking to. We know Allah, we don't know Rahman. And when he would say, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, they actually thought he was invoking more than one God. Keep that in mind. So go ahead, brother. Right. So notice, <clears throat> they say here, this cannot be Christian because Rahman was associated with the God Yahweh, the God of the Bible, right? Rahman was the God of the Bible, but they say, no, this Rahmanan cannot be the God of the Bible. It is devoid of explicit marks of either Judaism or Christianity. So it's lacking these things. So it must be Hanafite, in other words, heretical, right? At the same time, already from the end of the fourth century, a few explicitly Jewish texts attest an influential Jewish presence and in the 6th century, under Abraha, Christianity prevailed. Hold on. Abraha, the guy, the elephant guy. Okay, the Christian elephant guy, the guy that attacked Mecca with the elephants. Let's have a look. <clears throat> so, Quran 53.49 calls God the Lord of Sirius. Allah, hold on, Allah, not God, Allah is called the Lord of Sirius. The South Arabian deity Wad is mentioned in the Quran as well, along with other unidentified, un unidentifiable deities. So South Arabian polytheism was practiced until the life of Muhammad, even though it vanishes completely, supposedly, from South Arabian inscriptions that are dated between 380 and 560. So somehow, in that 180-year period, they have scrubbed the record. So before Muhammad, for 200 years, everything just disappears, just randomly goes away. Then a new monotheistic god arises in Arabia called Rahmanan in ancient South Arabia, often described as the Lord of heaven and earth. And the Quranic name Al-Rahman is probably related to that. Okay, great. One interesting inscription ends after mentioning Rahmanan with the phrase Rabhad bin Muhammad, which is translated as by the Lord of the Jews, by the highly praised. Your thoughts on that, Sam? What does that tell us? So they're, the taking, Lord... they're taking the term Muhammad, and this predates Muhammad as yes. an adjective for the God, that he's the highly praised? Yes, but the wow. Lord of the Jews. So in other words, Muhammad in this inscription is Yahweh. Did you guys catch it? You guys, I see, that's why you got to be paying attention. Even <clears throat> though I'm being distracted, I'm still focusing because I'm learning. Did you catch that the word Muhammad is being used not as a name of a man, but as an adjective describing God as the praised one? 
the Lord of the Jew Jews, he is Muhammad, the praised one. Are you catching it? Muhammad, an adjective used to refer to the God of the Jews, the Lord of the Jews, later becomes the name of this pagan, pedophile, <clears throat> false prophet. Keep that in mind. By the way, this was dated around where, when exactly? So this, I think, is between 380 and 560. Wow. Very cool. So what, right before Muhammad then? Yeah, before Muhammad. Yeah. Good. So Excellent. this interesting inscription. So this is an actual archaeological inscription, and it mentions Rahmanan as Rah bin Muhammad, translated as by the Lord of the Jews, by the highly praised. So Rahmanan here for the Jews was the god Yahweh, who was called Muhammad, the highly praised. And of course, I wonder, do we know of anyone called Muhammad today that 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 might have an issue with the Jews and Christianity and the Bible? Sam? Nothing to do with Islam or Muhammad of Islam or the Quran. You're making stuff up. Stop it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. I know we need to stop looking at these these. Yeah, well, I'm I'm starting to believe my lying eyes with all this evidence. Let's have a look. Then you talk about the Summa Summa Yafa inscription that ends with the invocation in the name of Rahmanan, in the name of Rahman and of his son, the conquering Christ. Okay, Bism Rahman. Bin Christos, Abraha's what? In the name of Rahmanan. So this Rahmanan was used by the Christians to describe Rahmanan and his son, the conquering Christ. Hallelujah. That's weird. Where Confirming did they get that? Said, right? Sorry. Remember, I said that earlier that there were inscriptions. So I didn't even know. See, guys, I didn't know he's going to mention this. Just to let you know, he doesn't show me his slides beforehand. I told you that there were references, Jews and Christians, referring to the true God as Rahmanan. Here it is. There you go. A Trinitarian inscription. A inscription where Rahmanan is the father of our Lord Jesus and Christ is his conquering son. Glory to God, brother. Keep, continue, man. You get me excited. Yeah. So Abraha. Now they mention Abraha, the guy, the elephant guy that took the elephant called Muhammad to Mecca and the elephant Muhammad refused to go there, right? Abraha's inscription contains equally clear formulas. And it says the inscriptions by Abraha. Abraha, the most significant, is CIH 541, which begins with, with the power, the help, and the mercy of Rahmanan and of his Messiah and of his Holy Spirit. Can I and say something? Here, yeah. Before you, I don't mean to cut you off. This is a Trinitarian prayer, brethren. So I wanted to stop you right there. Dated mm -hmm. around, you said around 541 AD. I think so. It, well, just well, that's the name. But, but remember, this is this is before Muhammad's birth or at Muhammad's birth, up to because forty Abraham years before Muhammad's time, birth. Right? You said yeah. like between last time you said around between 530, 550 AD. Keep in mind, <clears throat> Abraha, a Trinitarian Christian, 530, 550 AD. They found inscriptions that he wrote. Watch this Trinitarian inscription. He's invoking Rahmanan, the Merciful, his Messiah, and his Holy Spirit. A Trinitarian invocation, a prayer to the triune God by Abraha around 530, 550 AD, 6th century. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. I just want them to right, see No, this. that's good. No, that's fine, Sam. That's perfectly fine. I, I don't want to do all the talking and sound like I'm just, just giving a lecture to a blank screen, right? So understand, they say here, we're Rahmat, Rahmanan, we're Mashiach, okay? And the Ruach, okay? With the Ruach. So don't forget, the Muslims come later and they claim that the Rahmanan is Allah and that the Muhammad is Muhammad. But the Christians and the Jews were openly proclaiming in inscriptions that Rahman was Yahweh and you know and that Muhammad was 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 also a, a the praised one being God. So Muhammad is not God. <clears throat> so so they recount a Christian celebration and they go to Marib, which was the capital of Yemen. So, okay, let me continue here. Now, let's have a look at this God, La, okay? Now, this could also be Iyah, okay? Now, some will say this is I-A-H. However, <clears throat> this sound can change. The Yah becomes the La, depending on where you are, the dialect, the geography. But, but Yah and La are not so different as people would have you think, okay? So, most likely, the Mid Middle Eastern deity who gave the stimulus to the adoption of Iyah or La is the influence behind the name Karnos, the brother of Yahmos, who began the final thrust against the Hyksos, okay? The bull is born. This bull and the horns are very important. Might be the Egyptian equivalent of the epithet applied to Shin. Hold on. La, Ia, or whatever, is now Shin, the moon god Shin. 
describing him as a young bull with strong horns, the tips of the crescent moon. This imagery would be compatible with the Egyptian concept of the pharaoh as an invincible bull. And then there is a scene where the king is accompanied by his mother and three queens. The king is accompanied by his mother, so the moon and the sun and three stars, including Sitla, daughter of the moon god. Traces of, of this cult beyond this period are sporadic. Oh my, that, that could be something from Egypt. Who knows? Yeah, the moon god. Oh, it is a moon god. In its earliest attestations, the name La or Ia refers to the moon as a satellite of the earth. It then becomes conceptualized as a lunar deity, right? Whose manifestations from the hieroglyphic evidence can include the crescent of the new moon, the ibis and the falcon. So we had the ibis and comparable to the other moon deities, Thoth. Oh my golly, Idris. We have Idris right there. Idris, Thoth. This is starting to, man, all of these things are connecting like Lego. Am I wrong, Sam? Was this all connecting like Lego? Like I said, you're going to be showing how they all converge. All these clusters of pagan gods and goddesses become subsumed into Islam. They converge into Islam. So what he's showing you, if you're following the trail, Islam has pretty much taken all the cluster of these pagan gods and goddesses with the moon god as the chief and subsumed them into one religion under one deity called Allah. Yes, That's what you're correct. Saying. Correct, correct. So let's look at Malik. Malik al-Muluk, the king of the kingdom, the Malik al-Muluk. Okay, why is the word Malik important? Abdul Malik, the Malik, the Malik, the Malik. Let's have a look. Molik, Molok, so I'll start winding down. Okay. So Malik is the keeper of hell. What? Malik is the keeper of hell, the Abdul Malik, and the head of the angels of torment. Okay, fine, fine, fine. And this looks like some Muslim writing here, so... Yeah, this is blah, blah. The By bridges which the angels of torment pass upon above, blah. Okay, fine. Malik is the angel of hell, okay? Or the owner of hell or Satan. Okay, let's continue here. So, Malik, Mel, Molik, Melik, Malik, Abdal Malik, derived from follower of Baal, the servant or slave of Baal, the, the Karbal, 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 Karbal. So, Malik is Malik, is Abdal Malik, is Molik, is... Malik is Karabal. The name derives from combining the consonants of the Hebrew Melek, king, with the vowels of Boshet, meaning shame, the king of shame. In other words, shameful, vile, okay, something humiliating. He has a bull head, the root Malik, Muluk, Adram Malik. Some modern scholars have proposed that Moloch may be the same god as Milcom, Adad Milki, an epithet for Baal. And of Allah's 99 names, Allah has Allah's name, one of Allah's name number 84 is Malik al-Muluk, the king of the kingdom. Which kingdom did we just mention is the, the keeper of hell? Malik. Allah is called Malik. Malik is the keeper of hell and the head of the angels of torment. Oh my, oh my. So Molik was the god of the Ammonite peoples. Okay. And King Solomon, God was upset with Solomon for raising an altar near Jerusalem to Molik. Okay. God warned him not to and punished him for this, okay? So Molek was a god of the Ammonite. His name seems to be tried to the word Melek, which means king, which in turn suggests an older god, perhaps the Akkadian deity, okay, spelling Mulek, like Baal. His cult may have been transported to Carthage. Oh my God, now we're back to Baal, who killed kids, who burned, they burned kids to Carthage, where he was worshipped as the god Molek until the servants of the Olympian gods pulverized ancient Carthage. Carthage was where we went earlier, we started, with Carthage, where they were worshipping Baal, who was Molek, who is Molek, where they were sacrificing children. You see, now it's come full circle. Yep, and by the way, here's the <laughs> reference. Chapter 43, 77 of the Quran is where Molek is mentioned as the keeper of hell, because the inhabitants of hell will cry out to him. There it is, chapter 43, 77. There it is, guys, where Molek in the Quran is said to be the keeper of hell. There it goes, 43, 77. And it's in the Hilali Khan, and Hilal is the crescent moon god of Islam, is the crescent moon god of Arabia, Hilal. Nothing to do with Islam. Nothing to do. So, Zeba Zalmuna, I'll be quick and I'll do a couple more slides. So, in Judges 8, 21, Gideon rose and killed Zeba and Zalmuna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of the camels. Camels, camel people, crescents. Okay, fine, nothing to do with Islam. Besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants, and purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were on the necks of the camels, crescents and camels, crescents and camels, enemies of the Jews, enemies of God. 
enemies of the God of the Bible. Midian, was it a land or was it a tribal league? So that's a question. Was it actually a place or was it a league, a confederation? Hold on, Did, didn't the Yemenis have the Muqara Baal and the Muqara, which was a federation, a legal federation? Hold on, that's interesting. Midian, so hang on, Midian sits up here. Midian would be in this area, if I recall. And now you've got these guys down here who had the federation. They called it the Muqarib. And these guys have a federation, a Muqarib, up here. Oh my, that's fascinating. Hmm. Must be just coincidence. Some scholars have suggested that the name Midian does not refer to a geographic place or to a specific tribe, but to a confederation or league of tribes brought, to, brought together as a collective for worship, just like the Yemeni Muqaribs. Paul Haupt made this suggestion in 1909, describing Midian as a cultic collective. Okay, meaning an association or bunt of different tribes in the vicinity of a sanctuary. Tribes in the vicinity of a sanctuary? Hold on, that's, that, that could be familiar. Elat, on the northern tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, was suggested as the location of the first shrine or the second sanctuary at Kadesh. Elat, here, Elat, here. Interesting, near Tema, not that far from Tema, not that far from Petra for that matter. Fascinating. <clears throat> and it's just like the same concept as what the Yemenis had. They are thought to have worshipped a multitude, including Baal, Baal Peor, and the Queen of Heaven, Ashtaroth. Oh my God, the moon and the sun. Just coincidence, I'm sure. Enemies of Yahweh. So jump in any time, Sam, if you want to. So in Psalms, they've said, come and let us wipe out the Jews as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. So these people, their biblical purpose was to wipe out the Jews, the people of Israel. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb and all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us possess for ourselves the pastures of God. <clears throat> so Zeba and Zalmunna wanted to wipe out the chosen people of God at that time, right? Yes. And this would be Israel here, okay? Edom, Moab, and Midian down here. Modern Saudi Arabia is here. This is Egypt. This was the region here. Now, I'll borrow the name of Yahweh. This is from Arabia and Ethiopia by C.J. Robin, Oxford Handbook of Late Antiquity. A second question concerns the nature of Allah. Was he the god of the supporters of monotheism or a god of pagan origin? In the oldest revelations of the Quran, the name of Allah does not appear. Hold on. Allah is a late invention. The name Allah is a late invention. Why? Okay, let's have a look. When Muhammad refers to God, he says the Lord, or if he wants to give him a proper name, it is Rahman. He stole the name from the Christians, which is the name of the one God of the Jews and Christians of Arabia. So, Mo so Muhammad used to call his God after the name of the Christian and Jewish God, but then he changed the name. Allah is thus a God originating. What, what, what's this? Rahman is also the, the, the name of the God of the followers of Musaylama, who happened to be another preacher who claimed he was a prophet, just like Momo. But Allah is thus a God originating in polytheism. Inscriptions seem to confirm it at Qariyat al Fawl. Now let's go back. Qariyat al Fawl, we mentioned the Kinda. The Kinda established their kingdom capital here. And they controlled this entire region. The Kinda controlled this entire region. They were from here. And this was their capital, still standing today. So Allah is a God originating in polytheism. Inscriptions seem to confirm it. At Qariyat al Fawl, for example, a certain eagle entrusts the tomb he has built to Kal Allah and, and Atha the Oriental. Kal Allah. Hmm. Kal was Baal, was Atha, was. We mentioned it before. We went through the whole list. It's the same God. Kal, Wad, Wak, you name it. It's all it's all Baal. It's all al Makkah. It's the same God, al Makkah. Kal Allah. Allah was al Makkah. And Atha, the Oriental. The text is dated by the writing style to the beginning of the Christian era. So this name, Al-Rahman, is a Christian borrowing. They borrowed it. Uh, pause there for a moment, Sam. You want to comment? before? Yeah, I, I, want to, I want to understand what the quotation is saying. Uh, uh, brethren, when... The source is telling you that initially Muhammad didn't use the word Allah. Let me break that down a little more. If you've been reading Answering Islam, the website and the articles, because before YouTube and live stream, we didn't have live streams like Facebook and YouTube. It was all written articles. According to the chronology of the surahs of the Quran, I want you to pay attention to this. According to the dating of the surahs, certain surahs were written in Mecca, certain surahs were written in Medina. If you follow that chronology, there is proof that the earlier surahs 
did not use the term Allah. It's not found. Just like the earlier surahs make no connection between Ishmael and Abraham. It's mm -hmm. later on, as Islam progressed, later in the later Meccan period, and then in Medina, Muhammad starts referring to Allah as being Rahman and makes connections with Ishmael and Abraham. So if you follow the chronology, this is what the source is telling you, of the surahs, the earlier surahs, there is no use of Allah. You won't find the term Allah. You find Rahman. Later on, Allah appears. So based on the chronology of the Quran, when the surahs were composed, you see a progression. It's first Rahman, then Muhammad employs Allah, so Allah and Rahman become the same. And then earlier on, Muhammad is not aware of many of these connections like Ishmael and Abraham, and it's only later in the Medina period that these connections are made. So this is what the source is saying. The only way you can get around this is to deny the chronology of the composition of the chapters of the Quran. But the composition of the chapters are taken from Muslim sources uh, predominantly. But go ahead, brother. I just want to see why. Right. No, saying. thanks. No, so notice Kal has, Allah has many names, Hubal, okay? Amongst them, Hubal, Baal, Kal, Wad, Wak, you name it. Allah had a bunch of names, but all of them were Hubal. All of them were Baal. All of them were not the God of the Bible, right? <clears throat> so now, Astarte, a warrior goddess of Canaan and Syria, okay? The Semitic counterpart of the Akkadian Ishtar. Okay, so we, we, we like this god. We're just going to give her a name that suits our language. Her aggression can be seen in the bull horns she wears as a symbol of domination. The bull horns, the crescent. The crescent, the bull horn, the god Shin. The go oh, good. Okay, it's all coming together. Astarte is a battlefield goddess. Okay, when the Philistines, okay, killed Saul and his three sons in Mount Gilboa, they deposited the enemy armor as spoils in the temple of Astarte, she was a goddess of war. This is going to be important as well. We're going to be coming to that point as well. We were wrapping that up. So Hilal, okay, pre-Islamic Arabian deity. So let me see how far I'm going to go. I'm going to go a few more minutes. Let me just check where I am so I can figure this out. Okay. Okay. So, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, Sam, are you good to go? I mean, do you have anything else you need to do? So just, just try keeping track of time. No, I am. I'm fine, brother. You just uh, take as much time you need, and we'll wrap it up for next week. Okay. So Hilal is a god of the new moon. Okay, these are pre-Islamic Arabian deities. Let's go through a few names. Hilal is a god of the new moon. Am is the moon god of Kataban from Yemen. Kata Kataban. We're back to that from Yemen. He has the goddess Aterat as his consort. This is in Deuteroscopy 12. We have Yahweh commanding the destruction of Aterat's shrines so as to maintain purity of his worship. Atherat is Ashra, is Ashtaroth, is Astarte. Same god, same goddess, whatever, male, female, whatever. Same character, different geography, different language, different name, but same person. The prophets of Israel strongly warned God's people not to worship these false gods. We have in Numbers, in Kings, in Jeremiah, and Hosea. Kal or Hal or El, Ha'el, Ka'el, right, <clears throat> is moon god of the Hadramaut, the Yemen kingdom, okay, of Kinda. Right, the Yemeni kingdom of Kinda. The Hadramat, Yemen, Kinda. Okay, we've got that. Shin was the chief god of the Hadramites, as well as, of course, the Babylonian god, connected to the Shemitic god, Shin. <clears throat> Talab, Abu Talib. Mm, Abu Talib. Talib, 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 Talib. Mm. Muslim name. Is a moon god worshipped by the Sumay, a Sabaean tribal confederation. Okay. And Yatha, Yatha, is associated with salvation. His name means Savior. This may be an archaic equivalent to Yesha or Yeshua, a masculine noun meaning salvation, taken from the root Yasha. So hold on. So you're saying there was a God called Yeshua and he was a sal the Savior. He brought salvation. And the pagans said, hey, we like that idea. We're going to make up a new God called Yatha, called Yatha, and he brings salvation, but he's pagan. Sam, your thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, that's what happens. And I want you to understand what he said. What pagans do is they will adopt and add more gods and goddesses into their pantheon. Paganism, unlike biblical monotheism, that excludes <clears throat> gods and goddesses, they will incorporate 
gods and goddesses and new ones and adapt them. So you see what he's trying to tell you? Yeshua, which would have been the name for our God. Pagans hear that name, want to adopt it, the name, Yatha, and turn it into a pagan god. That's how paganism works. Keep that in right. mind. And Dul Khalasa is a god worshipped by the Bajila and the Katam tribes and was reportedly worshipped as a god of redemption. Dul Khalasa. His temple became known as the Kaaba of Yemen. The Kaaba of Yemen. Dul Khalasa had a Kaaba of Yemen. Where was this Kaaba of Yemen? It might have been down here at Hiran in Mahabisha. Oh my, oh my. Makuraba. Hmm. Fascinating. You know, X marks the spot. That's very interesting. Al Mahabisha, Makoraba, Makoraba, the Kaaba of Yemen. Okay. And of course, we've got the Yemeni corner hadith. We won't do that now today, but the Yemeni corner hadith. Remember, only God can forgive sin. So Jesus could forgive sin. That's a claim he made to be God. Amen. God forgives sin. No one else does. No human can forgive sin, right? Now, a priest might be able to forgive your sin because he has the he was given the authority. He doesn't have the power, but exactly. he has been given the authority to do so. Am I correct, Sam? Yes, the priest will tell you that they can pronounce you're forgiven on the basis of Jesus' death and his merits. Because if you do what the Lord tells you to do, then they can say, the Lord has forgiven you. That's how they do it. Yes. Right. But it's but Jesus. Now you've got, sorry, yeah. go on. No, I'm just saying Jesus is the one who's doing it. It's not them. They'll tell you. They stand in the place of Christ. And because of the authority of Christ, if you do what the Lord demands, they can say you're forgiven. Yes. But you're saying about this. Now, the Yemeni second. corner, what's significant about the Yemeni corner? That there's one or two corners, depending on who you ask, but there's at least one corner of the of the, of the the Kaaba. If you touch it, it forgives sins, according to That's Momo right. himself. Now, that means God is a rock. Yeah. How can a rock forgive sins? Well, what see, sense? this is why you're pagan, Lloyd. You're pagan because Muhammad said, on the day of judgment, the black stone will give it, be given two eyes and a tongue to intercede for you. And Allah can do that. And it's Allah's right hand on earth. That's what it says. The black stone is Allah's right hand on her earth. But you wouldn't know that, would you, pagan? But that. But hold on, hold on. But when we have, when you have an idol, that is the presence of your God on earth. That that's paganism. That is literally paganism. That's literally an idol. That that is the definition of paganism. There you go, thinking logically and rationally again. Yeah. So, and don't forget. Al Makkah. Okay, so pre Islamic, and of course, we've got another pre Islamic Arabian deity known as Al Makkah. And Al Makkah was where? Al Makkah was in the Kaaba. Al Makkah was in the Kaaba. Al Makkah was the god of the Kaaba. Makkah was the god of the Kaaba. Oh, you could, could there be a connection? Let's look at the Yatha, Savior, Yasha, Yatha, Yasha, Yashu, Yeshua, Ishu, Isa, Yatha, Savior, a pre Islamic god worshipped by the Sabaeans. Oh, wait, 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 wait. The Sabaeans who were in Haran, the Sabaeans who were the people of the book, the Sabaeans in oh, hold, hold on, and the Himerites of Yemen. Or oh, these no, these are the Sabaeans in the south, the moon god worshippers. The moon god worshippers took a god called Yasha, Yatha, Isha, whatever. Nine kings have a theophoric name prefixed by Yatha. The name may be an archaic equivalent to Yasha or Yasha, Yeshua, which is a masculine noun meaning salvation. Savior God, a Himeritic deity to whom in conjunction with the other local gods, a temple was erected in Abiyan by Abd Shams Aslam and his brother Martad. He was the special guardian of the town of Aden and his analog was the Chaldean divinity Salman or Salim, Salman, Salim. Okay, fine. So now things are just starting to mix. Now, Abd al-Jabbar, I wouldn't take this as fact, but Abd al-Jabbar, a very famous theologian from the 12th century, if I recall, refers to a Christian theologian, a Muslim theologian, known as Johannes, Johannes John, an Eastern Syriac historian form of the name John. He repeatedly uses Ishu to refer to Jesus. Okay, This form, which is unusual for an Arabic text, is based on the East Syriac for the name Jesus, so Isho. West Syriac is Yashu. Abd al-Jabad teaches the reader that Ishu is Syriac for Isa, the Quranic form of Jesus. Yeah. Just so by the way, I'm not necessarily believing this, I'm just presenting yeah. it that He's a Muslim polemicist who is polemicizing against Christianity, Abdul Jabbar. But he's quoting a Christian authority, Yohan, is saying that it's, yeah, and I speak Syriac. We say Ishu. Till this day, we say Ishu. Ishu Mshicha. We still use that. So, yeah. Just want you to know who Abdul Jabbar is. He was a Muslim polemicist who was polemicizing against the Christians in the, uh, I believe, around 10th century. But with that said, he's saying that the Christians called them Ishu 
or Yeshu, and he's trying to make a connection between Isa and Isha. Now, I'm going to send you a PDF file, God willing, this week. Ahmad Al... I even forgot his last name. Jalad. Mm -hmm. Ahmad Al Jalad. Did you know he found an inscription, pre-Islamic inscription, to the god Isa? Isa. And he believes mm -hmm. that's where Isa comes from, from this god Isa, because the... the Consonantal roots is identical to Isa in the Quran, and we'll talk about that more because I wanted to do a session on that. But anyway, continue, brother. Um, that's a good point. Hold on, I'll just bring up something quickly. This is um, so guys, I'm gonna wind down in a few minutes. Okay, this is uh, I'll show you this the earliest evidence of Christianity in Arabia. This is a rock inscription from the Jordanian desert. Now, I, I found this because I used to subscribe to the site before it came out on YouTube. And I did a show on it. It's on my it's on my channel. So this ancient inscription, okay, is the is this the earliest evidence of Christianity in Arabia? So remember, scholars will go to any lengths to insist that there was no Christianity in Arabia until about 1945. Okay, they will go out of their way to try and tell you that there was zero Christianity within a million miles of Arabia until about 20 weeks ago, right? And, of course, we know that the Ethiopians were, were Christians. They had a Bible with them, and that was in the second, third century already. So that's a lie. So Arabia was home, blah, blah, blah. But I just want to mention, so here, in this part of the world here, they find this rock, and it has an inscription here. This is the inscription here, and it's Safayitic, okay? It is Safayitic, yep. and gonna... it basically says, okay, it says, um, so al Jalad talks about it here. This is it. See, okay? that's him. That's him yeah. right there, see? And they speak uh, about it, and it says, and it corresponds to the name Isay. That's him. Okay, it corresponds That's to the him. name Isay, which corresponds to the name given to Jesus in the Quran. Now, Isay, help him against those who deny you. That's the same source you're quoting. So you found it. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. That's it. <clears throat> Just want to mention that. Yeah. Okay, so so that's now notice here, they mention a guy called a Jew from Yemen who converted to Islam. Now, bef now the hadiths were called the Israeliat. This word here, the, the hadiths were all called the Israeliat. Before they changed it to call them, calling them hadiths, they used to quote the Mishnah. Basically, the, the Jews had their own, obviously, traditions, right? And the Muslims used to quote those traditions as their own, which is very unusual, very weird. And these traditions that they used to call the Israeliat, the stories of the Jews, the stories of the Israelis, then they got rid of that and they started their own hadiths, right? But this guy converts to Islam, whatever his name is, Umar ibn Khattab or whatever. And it says here, it was his profound knowledge of the Bible and of Jewish tradition, okay? And of Yemenite traditions that earned him his reputation. Almost all traditions regarding the pre-Islamic prophets bear some marks of his erudition. Mm. So this guy, who apparently wasn't a very good Jew, who didn't know the scriptures that well, apparently he brought all of these Jewish stories into Islam. And that's why you've got these watered down, yes. paraphrased, completely backward stories within the Islamic texts yeah. about the Bible. Can I give you a story with Kaab al-Ahbar? Okay. Okay, Kaab al-Ahbar, guys, understand what he's telling you. Kaab al-Ahbar converted to Islam, supposedly. There's a tradition, and I have an article on it. This is found in Muslim sources like <clears throat> Ibn Kathir and others, that when he heard the Quran says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the sister of Aaron, he told Aisha, uh, that's a mistake because that would make her the sister of Moses. And Aisha said, you're lying. You're wrong. It's true. The mother of Jesus is the sister of Moses. He goes, okay, if you say so, even though there's a 600-year gap. And she went silent. So Aisha and the tradition said, you're the liar because the mother of Jesus, Mary, is the sister of Moses. You don't know what you're talking about. He goes, all right. Well, there's a 600-year gap between them, even though it's more. She went silent. She got embarrassed. So this Kab al-Ahbar is mentioned in a tradition where he caught the error of the Quran that says the mother of Jesus, Mary, is the sister of Aaron, the daughter of Imran, making her the sister of Moses. When he brought that mistake to Aisha's attention, she goes, you're lying. You don't know what you're talking about. It's true. So Aisha actually took it to me that Mary, the mother of Christ, was literally the sister of Moses. He goes, well, if you say so, even though there's a 600-year gap, and it said she went silent. And I'll get you wow. the article. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So now I'll, I'll wind down. Okay. So I'll wind down here, and I'll finish this. Um, so al maq okay, al maq name again al maq the creature or the possession of Yahweh. So there's a seal of the early seventh century, the 600s, 
okay, BC, okay, which bears the name of Al Makan Yahweh, Al Makan Yahweh, okay, and Yahweh Malak. The name may be taken to mean the creature of Yahweh or the property of Yahweh, and Yahweh the king, Yahweh the Malik, Yahweh the Malik, Al Mak, Al Mukka, Al Makka of Yahweh. Mm. So to this evidence should be added the possibly 8th century BC seal on Maknan Yahweh belonging to Mikna Yahu, the servant of Yahweh. This provides evidence for an active cult of Yahweh in such where such figures as Mikna Yahu could serve. So al Makkah could very well originally have referred to Yahweh until it then branched off and there was this competition. So here's a very odd, this is just a very odd, interesting little reference here. Wow. <clears throat> so there's a reference to an Anmaka who is a servant of Yahweh. Yeah, the creature of yeah. Yahweh. So yeah, it just is just very. And Yahweh is referred to as Malik. We're going to be getting back to Malik because that that's also a very interesting word, and we're going to see how that relates to Baal and everything. So this is just very weird. This is just something interesting that I've. Okay, last thing here. So go forth and sin no more. Table of ancient planetary deities in the Middle East. So the Roman god Sol <clears throat> was the Arabian god Alat and Shams meaning the sun goddess. The Babylonian had Shamash, Shams, Shamash, okay? The moon god was called Allah Ta'ala. Hold on, Sam, do Muslims still use the term Allah Ta'ala to describe Allah today? You better believe it. Allah Ta'ala. What, what, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. You better believe yeah, it. And, and it meant the most high god sin. So Allah Ta'ala sin referred to the Sin as Allah, the high God. Did you guys caught what he's saying? Moon God. Proving that Allah was a term used for <laughs> any chief God. Allah would be used for the chief dominant God. So if sin was the chief God, he'd be called Allah. Hubal, he'd be called Allah. So sin was Allah Ta'ala, the high God, the most high God. Yeah. And this guy was the moon God, Shin. And you can see here, Venus was Uzza. Just wanted to mention that. Shin, Shwen, Nana. So we've got this. <clears throat> and the Arabian moon gods were gods of war. So I'll start winding down here. Arabian moon gods of war. Moon gods, Allah, Am, il Umku, al Makka, same, same thing. Mahram, Osiris, <clears throat> Shin, Wad, Yera, Tera, al Makka. Different names for the same god. They were moon gods. The moon god is always a god of war. Understand that. The moon worship centers were Aksum, Haran. Oh man, that's fascinating. Jericho, Marib, Makka. Okay, all of these odd places like Tema as well. Okay, fascinating stuff. Allah in the Quran is consistent with the South Arabian war and moon god. Hans Kraus wrote, the main god, the national god of war in all South Arabian, in nearly all Semitic monuments, is a sure identifying mark of the moon god. The moon god is a god of war, is a god of jihad. Gee. And the Abyssinian moon war god was called Mahrim who is also al makkah Mahram happens to be a word that Muslims use as well, the Mahram, right? Yeah. And Hiran is al mahabisha equals Makarabu. We discussed that. This is a 1st to 2nd century plaque with a Sabain dedicatory inscription to al makkah At the top are a pair of sphinxes because they link themselves to Egypt, the wisdom of Egypt, with one raised forepaw that flank a central stylized tree of life, framed by a pair of date palms in full fruit. Dedication, <laughs> pardon me, this is dedicated to Al Makkah of Hiran. Hold on, Al Makkah of Hiran. Hiran? Oh, wh where would that be? That would be right here. Hiran, which is Makoraba, which is Al Mahabisha, which is where the maps of Ptolemy places Makoraba, and which is the Mukaribba, the Mukaribba, where the guys worshipped the original worshippers. And this is also known as the Mecca of Yemen. Okay. And it's a dedication to Al-Makkah of Hiran by Rey Babam, Riyab, and his brothers, okay, of Du Amran. So now you've got Al-Makkah of Hiran. Now let's have a look. The Sabaean moon and war god, Al-Makkah, right? The religion from temple inscriptions is enlightening about Allah, Al-Makkah's successor. Al-Makkah's successor was called Allah. The successor to Al-Makkah was called Allah. He was the Sabaean moon and war god, right? So Allah became the new moon and war god, right? And it says here, they've got an inscription in 250 AD. An inscription reads, okay, as for servant Kalkab, he has thanked the power and glory of al makkah Tahwan, the bull, 
because he has granted him to remain safe and unscathed in all those campaigns of war and battles. He has granted him to return with spoils of slaughtered enemies and with booty, which has delighted his heart. So al makkah who was succeeded by Allah, has granted him to return with spoils of 32 slaughtered enemies and with booty. A first century BC inscription <clears throat> says, al makkah of Hiran, al makkah has granted him trophies, spoils, and captives. And of course, you've now got Karib, son of the Ma'ali, 8th century BC, a massive inscription in al makkahs temple at Sirah, and he speaks of exploits that continued winning control of the incense route and crushing the kingdoms of Asan and Nashan. Mm. al makkah was a war god. The war god is the moon god. The moon god is the war god. The war god al makkah was replaced by Allah. And they yep. are talking here about Nahal. And didn't Muhammad say he was, he was, he was given spoils of war and he would slaughter right. his enemies and return with booty? Does that sound Chapter kind eight. of familiar? Chapter 8, verse 1 and 41 says, the booties. In fact, the chapter it's called itself, chapter 8 of the Quran, it's called Surat al-Anfal. Anfal means the spoils. There's a chapter in the Quran called the chapter of the spoils, the booty, the spoils of the war. And if you go to chapter 8, verse 1, Surat al-Anfal, -an the spoils, it says, and the spoils belong to Allah and his messenger. And in chapter 8, verse 41, it states, that Allah and his messenger get a fifth of the booty, the spoils. There's a chapter mm -hmm. in the Quran called the spoils, the booty of war. Al yeah. Anfal, chapter eight. Yep. <clears throat> so, so maybe this is a good place to end. Um, you know, I'll just jump just to show you guys um, Hiran's moon god, god of the Kaaba. They've got Rab and Haran. This is from a from an inscription. Rab Haran. Nami proposes the following translation: The Temple of Hiran. Rab is the name of the Sabaean moon god. Rab, Muqarib, the Muqaribs, considered as the lunar quarter, okay? And what is father? Oddly enough, the, the god Wad is called father. What is a father? That's really unusual for, you know, Arabic gods. Hiran, also Haran, also Haran. <clears throat> and in Ezekiel, Haran is mentioned, the merchants of Sheba. Okay, so, yeah, but maybe what I'll do is I think I will finish here. I think that's a good place to stop. And um, so now we've established, uh, have, we, have we established connections between all of these gods are actually the same god same pantheon different names different places and it's got nothing to do with islam muhammad most definitely has nothing to do with islam muhammad you're a pagan but it confirms what people have said the gods and goddesses of the nations if you really go back and trace them it's the same cluster of gods and goddesses where the names have changed story slightly changed and embellished Slight mutations, but they're the same cluster of gods and goddesses. And according to our Bible, if you read Psalm 95, verse 5 in the Greek version, Psalm 96, verse 5, if you go to Hebrew, and if you go to 1 Corinthians 10, 19 to 22, specifically 1 Corinthians 10, 20, we are told the idols of the nations, the gods of the nations, are demons. It's Satan, the devil, and demons. So these are demons. This is Satan who appears in these clusters of gods and goddesses, and they all converge into Islam because Allah is Baal and Baal is Satan. That's what he's showing you. Right. Exactly. We've seen that, that that we've we've seen Rahman. They took over Rahman, right? The, yep. the name of the God of the Bible, Rahman, used by Jews and Christians. They borrowed that. They borrowed Yatta, Yeshua. They took Muhammad, which was referring to the praised one, meaning the God of the Bible, and they gave that name to an imposter called exactly. Muhammad. Precisely. Now, here's that tradition I was telling you about, about Lloyd. Before you leave, you want uh, I've given the link to your YouTube channel description box. Go there, subscribe, watch his v shows. He's available to come to your channels. If you guys want him to come to your channels, he's available to do that. Contact him. And also, you have links to your material there that they can access, correct? If they go to YouTube channel. I've got loads of materials and thanks. Look, also, some guys are asking if I share my slides. I mean, Sam, I gave you a copy of this. I don't give yes. it out to many people. I, you know, this is, this is, I mean, this slide, this set of slides is like 120 hours of work. I, I'm not kidding. Yeah. It's at least, yeah. I mean, this is 120 hours of just putting the slides together, right? Yes. And I mean, and we don't want people to steal your work. 
the time and effort because the labor is worthy of his wages. So you need to pray and fin- uh, support him financially because this is a lot of work. We're all in full-time minister. I was, I wish I was rich so I can give him tons of money to do it, but we're not. So brethren, he spent over 120 hours. So this is why he's hesitant to just give out his slides to people who won't appreciate it or plagiarize it or edit it or pervert it. So, but go to his YouTube channel, watch his videos, support him financially if you can, pray for him, invite him to your channels because he's open to go to any channel to share this and it's top nut stuff. Now I want to read this for you too, brother. Here's that tradition with Kab al Ahbar. I gave you the link to my article. Notice, it was narrated from Ibn Jarir, narrated from Yaqub, narrated from Ibn Ulaya, say that five times fast, narrated from Sayyid Ibn Abi Sadaqah, narrated from Muhammad Ibn Sirin, who stated that he was told that Kab, there goes Kab al Ahbar, said that the verse that reads, O sister of Aaron, Harun, does not refer to Aaron, the brother Moses. So he's saying, Mary cannot be the sister of Moses. So the sister of Aaron doesn't make her sister Moses. Look what Aisha said. Aisha replied to Cobb, you have lied. You're a liar, Cobb. She is the sister of Moses. So even Muhammad's child bride thought that Jesus' mother was a sister of Moses. So then look what he says. He goes, all right. Well, here's the response. And uh, it's in the article. This is Cobb Ahmad who influenced Islam with this perversion of Jewish traditions that he garbled up. Cobb responded, O oh, mother of the believers, if the prophet has said it, and he is more knowledgeable, then this is what he related. Besides, I find the difference between them, Moses and Jesus, to be 600 years. He's way off. It's more than that. <laughs> he said that she remained silent. He embarrassed her. She couldn't say anything. Oops. Oops, Muhammad. But there you go. So any final words, brother? And by the way, do you like this time better? It's an hour earlier, or do you want to stay at the same time? Um, an hour earlier is it's actually easier for me. It's actually better. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. From now on, we're going to bring him on, God willing, Lord willing. Instead of now, right now, I'll tell you what time is in New York time, when we started. Okay. 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is when we started. 1.30 p.m. our time. So do you want to do that again, 1.30 or 1? We can do 1 even. 7, okay. it could work. I mean, it could work, but maybe. Up to you. Um, it's one thirty. You want to just say one thirty, not one, because you said earlier was better. Seven is seven. That would be seven p.m. my time. But the thing is, when my clock changes, it'll switch to six in the future. Oh, well, you know? huh? Okay, it's okay. So well, seven is okay for now. Seven's okay for now. Okay. So let me know. So then we'll just stay next week, God willing. You want to do one thirty p.m. my time, seven thirty p.m. your time to be safe. Yeah, look, this time is good. I mean, if we can okay. do 30 minutes sooner, I, I can probably manage it if need be. But otherwise, this is a yeah, good time. Yeah, we can adjust too. You let me know if you need to do a large. Yeah. So thank you guys so, for making this success. Go ahead, brother. So what did you learn today, Sam? I learned that you know nothing. You are an Islamophobe. You hate Muhammad and has nothing to do with Islam. But all joking aside, you have demonstrated conclusively moon worship was prevalent and dominant all throughout Mesopotamia. In southern, northern Arabia, Nebuchadnezzar spent 10 years in Arabia worshiping the moon god Sin, and that the Arabs worshiped the moon god, and all of these gods and goddesses all converge into one god called Allah. In fact, that's what they accused him of, as you said. He's and made we are going to get to that point, actually, as well. Yep. So glory to God for your research, brother. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Brethren, the link to his YouTube channel in the description box. Go there, subscribe, watch. And you who have YouTube channels, reach out to him. Like Full Armor Apologetics, he brings in people to do sessions as well. If you want, invite him, pray for him, and support him. The labor is worthy of his wages. So, brother, any final words, and we're going to wrap it up. I mean, look, I mean, uh, the whole aim of this thing is to prove that this has nothing to do with Islam, and it's very important yes. that we, we do that, right? Because, you know, anytime, anytime it's correct, it's got nothing to do with Islam. So as long as we start to hear that it's got nothing to do with Islam, we know it's 100%. <laughs> And don't trust him. He's a pagan because it has nothing to do with Islam. All right? You bull worshiper. You're just full of bull crap. If you guys don't catch the joke because yeah. bull. No, it's going to start piling up. I mean, all of this. I mean, I hopefully I'm tying all these threads together. It is all going to tie together. We're going to go back to Baal. We're going to learn more about Baal. And we're going to start seeing all of this stuff start to connect again. You sure it's not going to be a magic ball? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> nothing to do with <laughs> right, brother? You know, yeah. It's a family-friendly channel, Sam. Brother, yeah. It's it's G-rated. Lord bless you guys. Pray for this man. If I didn't Thank think you. his stuff was top-notch, he wouldn't be here because I want top-notch research. 
And I'm very, very strict on the information because I know Muslims, if we make even one mistake, if it's innocent, they will run with it and capitalize on it to discredit us. So if I didn't trust his scholarship, he wouldn't be here. So that tells you the brother is credible. Pray for him. Support him financially. Prayerfully go to his channel. Invite him. Lord willing, next week again, same bat time, same bat channel, if the Lord wills. And remember, nothing to do with Islam. And thank you, everyone. And thank you, Sam, for the support. Thank you, everyone, for the support. It's been greatly appreciated. I really enjoyed this. I enjoy sharing this with you. And um, I really appreciate the encouragement. It's been so positive. Beautiful. Learn this. Use this. Make screenshots. Um, my, my archive is available. You can ask me questions. And, um, and yeah, if you, if you have questions, drop comments. I do I've obviously observe them. And uh, look, all these links are available, all the books that I'm using. You can see I'm using screenshots from actual references. Yes. I'm not making it up. I'm not giving opinion. I'm, I'm using resource after resource. I've got hundreds of resources here that I'm using. Proper, decent academic resources. I'm not making it up. It's not opinion. It's not, you know. That's what she said. This was gold. Indeed it is. Labor is worthy of his wages. We're not doing it to get rich. We're doing it because we want to be used of the Lord Jesus to devote ourselves fully to do the research, to equip you, and you're the warriors who are going to take it into the field. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Thank you, brother. See you next week, God willing. If the Lord will, same bad time, same bad channel. And I want you to go to sleep remembering my voice in your ears has nothing to do with Islam, Lloyd. Yep. Remember that.